Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you here. Uh, really, we are really happy to see you all in the second day of uh, our BIOR symposium. And today we have two parallel sessions. And you are arrived in session about uh, water resources and env environmental safety. Uh, today we have a series of really nice presentation. In the first part of the day, we will talk and discuss more about water resources. And in the second part, we will try to join One Health, something like that, in environment. So don't leave us until the end. Enjoy all the day. Uh, some organizational yeah, information, some technical, technical details, so please keep your time so people can change the sessions. Uh, some of us need to do that. Uh, during the sessions, please use uh, the doors behind you. Don't use these front doors. Um, what else? We are live. We are on live, yes. So if you don't like that you are being recorded, then <laughs> As Valdis yesterday said, leave now. Or you could choose another session. Yeah, or you can join the other session because yeah. the are, other is not are online. online. They are offline. We are open access, they're not. Uh, when you give any questions, please use the microphone for the recording. Um, for the time, we have these uh, uh, papers. Five minutes left, two minutes left, and then you have to finish. For normal presentation, we have uh, 20 minutes time, and that means we have uh, we are aiming for 15 minutes presentation, and then we would like to discuss every presentation and it's uh, five, five minutes. So very long discussions. Mm -hmm. Be ready, make your questions, prepare your questions, and be active. However, in the morning we will start with the, with two keynote speakers, and those presentation are a little bit longer because they are. They are lucky. They, they have lucky. more time. <laughs> and uh, we will start this morning with Professor Anders Andrushaitis. I think uh, every scientist in Baltic Sea know who is Andres, yes, uh, sure. especially in Latvia. And uh, if you are a scientist in Baltic Sea, you should aim for bonus projects. And uh, Andres will explain what's the difference between bonus and bonus. Yeah, I'm keeping the big bursts of money. So it's <laughs> Easy, I'm a humble big person. Okay, I'm yeah. All right, where is my presentation? <laughs> Somewhere. How many of the Three. prison prison people don't understand Latvia? I'm just wondering. Okay, then I continue in English. In the microphone. In the mic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all right. So, yeah, now, good morning, everybody. And it's, it's a privilege, of course, to, to be the first speaker. Congratulations to the BR Institute for the 10 years anniversary. Wish you to live another 10 and 20 and how many years you need to mature. This is just the beginning, I understand. I was, when I was making these slides, I was thinking that this will be something to be given at the plenary with all the ministers and dignitaries and everybody. And in that case, of course, you need a sticky presentation and sticky title. This is why I have these movements. There is nothing wrong with movements, of course. They are good and cute. And I will tell you a story how why I decided to have them. How I go forward? Okay, I'll use this one. Yeah, right. I was in, uh, last autumn, I was flying on the Finner. Which, which button? Oh, okay, that's easy. Right, I was flying somewhere on the Finner, <coughs> and I came across in the in-flight magazine this ad by, by movements or by those who own movements nowadays. They're celebrating 75 year of, of the, the first publication of the first book about movements. And, and I don't know how many in Latvia know them, but in Finland, of course, everybody knows them. This is a big business, big merchandise nowadays. Some people are collecting cups and, and mugs and, 
and other things with, with, with these Moomin characters. So they are very popular, everybody knows them. Now they are saving the Baltic Sea. And, and if you read, read this text, there's quite a lot of text there, but anyway, the, you, can, you can, while I'm speaking, you can try to read it. Uh, basically, there's nothing wrong there. The problem is that this gives a, a, the reader, well, the Chinese tourist on a, a thin air flight, impression that, first of all, the Baltic Sea is the most dirty sea on the world. Okay, we can argue about that. I hope we will hear much more during this session. Secondly, you need to collect one million euros. They have so far collected 5,000 something, and then Mumi trolls will, will take a care, basically, and, and, and the Baltic Sea will be clear, uh, clean and nice, and, and, and everything will be fine. Of course, we all know that things are much more complicated and not so easy at all, and, and this is the, the, the red thread, the red line of, of my presentation. Let's go into, yeah, and to more serious stuff. And, and to, to, to be more serious, of course, I'm right. As, as this is already told, I've, for a number of years, I, I, I'm in charge of the scientific part of the bonus program, and now we are preparing a new program, which is called BANOS. You guess, it's Baltic and the North Sea. Right, and, and so uh, I will be kind of warming up the more scientific presentations which will follow, uh, and this will be a, a little bit more general presentation of what's happening in the Baltic Sea. You know th then, from starting from 2007, we have the Baltic Sea Action Plan, which is actually a plan of measures to, to improve the, or to reach the, the, uh, the, the good environmental status in the Baltic Sea. And 2021, according to the Helsinki Commission's commitments, is the year when the Baltic Sea environmental status should become, voila, good. Right. Of course, in the real life, it doesn't happen like, it happened like this. The last holistic assessment of the Baltic Sea environment shows that things are more complicated, of course. Uh, there is quite a bit, I'll not go into the details, you, we can argue about them, uh, but basically in terms of biodiversity, things are not so good so far in the Baltic Sea. The red bars in this slide uh, give uh, evidence about this. And also, in, if we look into the chemistry there and pollutants, there, is qu there are quite many red dots still indicating that the condition in the Baltic Sea is actually not so good. Or, to be more frank, really shitty, really bad. So, we need a lot of knowledge, and, and Helsinki Commission is now working on the plans of measures. And they're, test, most importantly, they're trying to understand if the measures which have been taken or at least tried to be taken up since 2007, have they been efficient and, and, and what should be done to, to really these measures to become more efficient. Sufficiency of measures is the key word now. And of course this requires a lot and a lot and a lot of, of knowledge. And, and the most important questions for these groups working for the sufficiency of measures or the, the biggest challenges are those which I have listed in the bottom of this slide. There is a time lag, there are cumulative effects between different pressures, and of course there are uncertain, unlinear uh, relationships between pressures and the, the status of the environment. We all know it, I, I don't need to preach about this further in this audience, I believe. So, yeah. As, as I am managing the Baltic Sea Research Program bonus, I wish to show you a few examples of what, what we are doing to, to understand the system, to be able to more, for more safe and confident predictions and to answer these big questions about the pressures, the status of the system, and the ways for sustainable use of the so-called ecosystem services. Well, I have four examples here. I will quickly jump through them, and I don't need to go into many details because actually two next speakers are, 
are involved. Chen Oyever and Livar Sputnis will be talking more about two very interesting projects and, and some science related to those projects. The one thing about which we know quite a little is genetics. The genetic composition, genetic intraspecific diversity in different, spe in different species of the Baltic Sea. And we, as we all know, biologists at least, genetic diversity is the the, the stock, the resource for, for evolution, uh, resource for adapt adaptation. So this is very important. And, uh, and we know particularly very little. And if we look into how diverse are our several uh, commercially used species and, and some species whose, whose habitats have become very, have shrunk very, very, very small, we see that there are problems. And we, we have been implementing for several years Bonus Bambi project, and they, they were looking particularly in these things. And one of the findings, the, the simple sociological finding uh, a part of the genetics is that actually in the, in the measures, in the, in the policy and decision-making part, there is very little understanding and very little concerns at the moment uh, about the intraspecific diversity in the Baltic Sea species. We know very little and, and, and the policy level actually is, is not very worried about that. Although in those parts where we know something, the, there are reasons to be worried indeed. The other uh, project which I want just to, 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 to highlight uh, a little bit is the so-called Baltic Up project and these guys uh, they did a very interesting thing. We are, we are modeling, many of us are modeling and doing, making the predictive uh, projections of what will happen with the Baltic Sea in 10 and 25 and 50 years. And this is based on more on, or less reliable models. We are trying to uh, improve those models to, be the, uh, to make them more re reliable, more precise, uh, more, more detailed. Some of us find in that, in, during that uh, course of, of investigation that more, more detailed your model becomes, less, less predictive and less trust, trustworthy it, it is. Anyway, we are all, all those uh, who are dealing with the modeling and, and projections of future, we are dealing with the with uh, some, some input uh, uh, pressures and, and input variables for those models. What, what will be, I don't know, what will be the agriculture? What will be fisheries? What will be uh, the, 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 the quantities of different pollution, pollutants entering the sea and so forth in 25 or 50 years from now? Of course, the question, what will, what will happen with the global climate and the climate here in the in the Baltic Sea region. These are the big questions which brings, which links uh, by uh, the, the modelers and, and the natural scientists to these societal questions. And these guys in this project, which is a mixture of societal scientists and the natural scientists, the modelers, they actually downscale the global socio economic uh, pathways, the s different scenarios, what would happen with the society on a global level. They tried to downscale it down to the Baltic Sea region and they really found uh, some very, very interesting results which were very useful f further for the natural scientists and mathematicians for the predictive modeling. I will not go further into the details. This is a very interesting project. I, I advise you to, take, to, uh, to, to check what's going on there. And then, of course, I come to these. Many of you know the titles. Bonus Inspire was one of the most, most uh, interesting projects in, in, in the past years of, of Bonus. Hen Oyever was, was a coordinator. Uh, this was, if I, if I would need to, to say a few words about this project, this is, and, and you please, Hen, correct me if I am wrong, I think this is all about the, what we call in textbooks the spatial ecology. And the revelation is actually, and the, and the, and the base, uh, baseline of, of this project was that we know quite a little about the whereabouts of the fishes, basically. The project was uh, aiming at the commercial species of fish in the Baltic Sea, herring, cod, sprat, 
flounder, the dimensional. I think that's that's it. And about their whereabouts, where, how, where, where they are they located? How in in different life stages? Uh, what's happening with these populations and sub subpopulations? Are they connected? Uh, and uh, and so on. And of course, then the, the purpose of all this is to increase our ability for a spatial management. To check if our management units are are actually spatially enough explicit to be to be able to successfully manage the the, the, the stocks. Well, I, I stop at this point and, 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 and we will discuss about this. And I believe that many of you in this audience uh, know about these things much more. Uh, this, this was an amazingly interesting project. Like I remember as, well, I'm a biologist, but not a fish biologist. For me, the amazing notion which I found in one of the, one of the reports or, or papers was about the, the migration and spreading of the cod and revelation that there is only a small proportion in the cod stock, and these are huge pelagic fishes which might easily cover the whole Baltic Sea, you know, in, 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 a, in a fast pace, that they are actually staying rather put, and there is only a small proportion in the, in the population which are the, the pioneers, which are, which are moving to other parts and, and searching for, for better life in, in some other places. Well, maybe I, I'm simplify, simplifying, but that was amazingly interesting. And then the blue webs is all about the food webs. We all know that the food webs is that what is, bring, what is keeping together the ecosystems and something is happening with the food webs in the Baltic Sea, we are all depending on those food webs and, and these guys in this project. And again, we have people uh, linked with the food webs, uh, with the blue webs uh, project in this audience, and there will be at least one speech about that. And uh, our ability to look into the future food webs is rather limited, and, and this project is trying to do what they can to look into the to 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 uh, try to predict project what, how which way the food webs of the future Baltic Sea would develop and how they would would look in a certain number of times. By the way, uh, many of the bonus projects are producing the 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 outreach materials. Some of them are more successful. Some are less. Uh, Inspire project produced this, what, was it a children's book, right? I took a picture, I stole, sorry, I don't have credits here, I stole from, from the Inspire website this, this nice picture. So the project produced also the cart cartoon book for, for children uh, about the little fish which is kind of developing and growing and meeting different enemies and different reasons to swim from one place to another. Fine. Yes, and then when one achievement was what we are doing in the bonus program. We are trying to, to push and, and, and motivate projects to work together. And as a culmination of this several years already ago, the, uh, the paper which presents the Baltic Sea as a time machine for the future coastal ocean was published. That was a big hit. The, the quotation uh, was high. The, the impact was very high. It was published in Science Advances. Well, there are some, uh, how to say, there are some questionable points in this article, but basically, uh, yeah, it was, it was something very interesting, and we have some authors of the big list of co-authors of, of this paper, which I think included something like nine pro different Baltic Sea projects. We have some authors in this room again. Right, so we have one program, one project in the Baltic Sea. Uh, all the countries around the Baltic Sea are participating. We have implemented 64 projects so far. We are doing quite a lot of work related to the practice, uh, and we are looking into the future.
So we are now in the transi transition from Bonos to Bonos, and Bonos stands, of course, for the Baltic and the North Sea. Some people are arguing that this is a risky path. Uh, we will try to connect these two, uh, two seas together. They are connected, they are in the same climate and biogeographical zone. Uh, we have several countries which have interests in the Baltic and the North Sea uh, together, like, like Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. So those, those countries are very interested in, in joining. And uh, also the pressures are approximately same and on the same pretty high level of magnitude. Just imagine we have one of the busiest marine transportation routes going from the North Sea, from the Atlantic Ocean through the Danish Straits, then into the Baltic and, and trespassing the whole Baltic Sea to the eastern Baltic harbors. And, and these, this marine transportation, of course, is related to quite many pressures. So they are, we are trying to, to, to combine those two together. Uh, there is one interesting thing which, which I have heard from several scientists now as a positive. Generally, at least scientists in the Baltic Sea are not very happy because they think, okay, you have been focusing on the Baltic Sea, you have been investing all that money, which is about 100 million euros, not a, big, not a small piece of money. You've been investing this all into the Baltic Sea. Now you will share it between two seas. It's not so good. But then, as a positive, line, I've heard from some scientists that, okay, there, if you look into the Baltic Sea alone, the trans transition zone between the, the Baltic Sea and the North Sea, which, where many things are happening, which is very important, it stays somehow on the border. Now, if you put those two seas together, you have these, the straits, the mixing zones, the, the, the frontal zones, uh, which, which are uh, the Danish Straits, of course, Katagat and Skagerrak and the Great Belt and Small Bay Belt and Arizona. You have this very interesting, very important area in the mid very middle of your picture. Right, so this is where we are going into the, in the future. We have many uh, research funders. We have ICS, we have Helsinki Commission and JPI Oceans and Oslo and Paris Commission as a strategic partners as well. Uh, the backbone of, of the future program will be this triangle of, of the sustainability. We will study the, uh, how, to, how to achieve healthy seas and coasts and we are doing this of course in, with the purpose to improve the human well-being and to, to, to do something good for sustainability of so-called blue economy or, or sea-related economy. And, and there are, I will not read those, I believe, I'm running to the, to the end of, of my allowed time, but there are several topics with already in the embryo research agenda of the future program, which might be very rel relevant to also to, to your audience here today and to, to the BR Institute and its fisheries part in particular. So we are now working on this. By end of this year, the research agenda of the future program will be ready. And then uh, we hopefully can, well, later, la yes, very good. I'm about to finish. Hopefully, uh, by the beginning of 21, we in the Baltic and the North Sea are ready to start the new program. The problem, or I don't know, maybe it's, it's again, it can be turned positive. Uh, uh, the, the, the problem or the issue is that something similar, but maybe a few years behind us, is happening also in the other uh, European sea basins. And, and some people in Brussels are willing to put everything together and create a one huge uh, all-inclusive partnership whose working title is Climate ne Neutral, Sustainable and Productive Blue Economy. And, and since, well, the, the pace and the, the, uh, the, the level of maturity in different programs is, different regional sea programs is different, uh, uh, that we have a promise that something 
uh, will start in, in 2003. So there is some time to live. We'll see how this all develops. This develops in the future. This is my, my last slide. This is a place where the Baltic Sea and the North Sea are meeting. And I leave you here. And if you, we have some time for discussion or questions or anything, I'm ready. Otherwise, I'm staying the whole the day, all this day here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Do we have any question? Please, the mic. Thank you, Andres. Can you yeah. move one slide back? Um, if, we, if we look at the map, there is nothing towards north. Uh, Arctic is currently the big deal also in the yeah. EU. Uh, some of the areas there are Icelandic waters, Norwegian Sea, Barents Sea, there is nothing currently. Are there any strategic plans also for Europe to move and cover those areas? Because there are some plans in ICS. Yeah. Uh, International Council for the Explanation of the Sea to deal with those. So any, any, do you have any comments on that? I, I got it. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very good point. And, uh, yeah, theoretically, everybody knows the Arctic is, is the kitchen of, oops, the kitchen of, uh, of many things which are happening in, in the, here, in the, in, at least in the North Atlantic, the, the part which we are interested in. There's no surprise that ICS is looking in, towards our, our, our Arctic and also many, many countries. And, and there is some earmarking of the interest towards Arctic also in, this, in these plans of the big, this big mega partnership, which the big blue arrow, which, which I have on the on the uh, uh, right side of, of my timeline, how it will materialize and, and how much the, the member states will be interested to go into the Arctic and who will do this. The problem is that here in the Baltics, on the coast of the Baltic Sea, there are several countries who are interested, but there are also many countries who are not interested at all in, in these issues of, of the Arctic. So this is all the, the question mark. If you look into some embryo documents about this, mega partnership of future, you can find some, some kind of placeholders for Arctic. Remarkably, you also can find there also something about the inland waters and fresh waters. And this is again a challenge, how much, to what agree, degree we can incorporate the, the fresh waters issues into this future big blue partnership. Thanks. Sorry, I have a small question. As we nowadays speak a lot about the society's involvement in the science, and you talked a lot about science, what is the society's attitude and involvement in those projects? Programs? You, mean the, you mean the social yep. science, so, social economy, and yeah, I already gave this one example, which was the Baltic Up, which actually the, the project was, uh, was initiated by social economists, actually, and they, they came by combining, well, I have a story about this, but that's but maybe more to the coffee time, but basically, yeah, we are trying, the, you know, interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary science and merging the natural and societal issues and knowledge, is, these are the big titles and we are trying to do uh, as, 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 as good as, uh, to be as good as we can. Interestingly enough, in the last ICS annual science conference, several of you certainly were there, we had a big consultation workshop with the scientific community about these future pieces, uh, bits and pieces in the uh, program. And, and we were kind of focusing the, the discussions knowing what is the ICS annual science conference, we were focusing the discussion towards the fisheries and aquatic natural science issues. And it happened so that the audience was full of societal societal people and they started, they, they raised a big shout how important it is to include the societal questions. Of course it is. And we are doing as, as good as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. We have small presents. Yeah, and I, will, I asked some of the materials 
some small technical problems. Tell a puzzle. I would like to invite Hen. Uh, Hen Oyever is a professor in Tartu University. He is working also in Danish uh, uh, Fishery Institute. Uh, Hen is also vice chair of uh, ISS uh, ACOM, responsible for uh, uh, ecosystem approach, introducing ecosystem approach in uh, scientific advice. And today he will talk about uh, bio invasions and non-native species, what is one of the topic of his studies. And uh, we are really happy to have Hen today in our symposium. And Hen, floor is yours. Thanks, Didis. This, this, uh, uh, this, this is next. One. And this is pointer. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't appear. Okay, uh, which is, okay, okay. Uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I join uh, Andris with con congrat congratulating Bayor for 10th anniversary and wish all the best for Bayor for the next 110 years. Uh, the topic was actually selected by Ditsis. Uh, I proposed him kind of three, four potential topics, and uh, please blame him if this is not of interest for you. Uh, the talk is not about the Baltic Sea. It paints the global picture, historical picture uh, about by invasions. Uh, the, uh, um, the study, uh, it took more than three years to put it together. Uh, it has more than 400 references uh, in the final paper. I will show the paper later, it's, it's a free access. Uh, and we, we uh, condensed the references by the order of two, so basically initially we had about 800 references at the end. And uh, it was initiated by some of the discussions that, oh, we don't know anything about non-native species by invasion, so this is totally new stuff. Doing nothing is sufficient. We argue that, argue that uh, uh, introduction of uh, uh, species or species transfers in the marine realm is a uh, uh, millennia old phenomenon. Those uh, introductions were facilitated in the beginning, in early stages, until let's say 1950s when uh, first uh, really bad Cases appeared uh, in terms of, of accidental introductions uh, by ships, uh, either um, ballast water or, or biofouling. Uh, the legislative side is lacking far behind several centuries. And there are, there are really complex measures needed to mitigate the impacts and, and minimize the risk of future invasions. Uh, I'm just question to the organizers, will this uh, presentation all made available for the, all the attendees? So, okay, this is good. Uh, uh, I will skip about half of the slides, uh, I have about uh, more than 40, so the time doesn't allow to show you all of them, so you are welcome to check uh, some of the details which will be missed during the presentation. Uh, I think the terminology important, is important. Uh, Non-native species are only species which are transferred by humans from one place to another, uh, across, moving across natural borders. All the rest are native species or cryptogenic species for which we don't know whether those are non-native or, or native. And uh, some of the methodologies actually can help here. Uh, to uh, identify the origin of species like uh, uh, molecular tools or genet genetic methods. Uh, so there is, a, uh, I mean, uh, basically, 
uh, marine uh, bioinnovation scientists and terrestrial bioinnovation scientists have uh, often co contradicting ideas and, and they are not always on the same uh, frequency. Uh, except the unified generic framework about the introductions. That there are a couple of, uh, a couple of distinct uh, blocks related to transport, introduction, establishment and spread. And, and very often uh, uh, non-native species, this is a right, uh, upper right hand side of the, <coughs> of the, of the slide, uh, non-indigenous non species uh, in, in, the, in the terminology equals to invasive species. It's not invasive species, it's a, it's a, non -native, a non subset of non-indigenous species which uh, spreads, which has an impact and so forth. And we don't know which is, what triggers non-native species to becoming invasive and sometimes vice versa. Oops, sorry, this was the wrong button. Yeah, so this is a paper uh, co-authored by uh, multiple people across uh, different continents, uh, published in PLOS One, this has a free access. So, the, uh, the far most important uh, pathway is a shipping. Uh, we know very little on uh, early stages of shipping. What uh, was a biota in, on or abroad of the ship uh, or in uh, uh, attached to the hull, there is, uh, we know that, that the biota was often very rich, but we don't have an, even qualitative evidence. But we know that uh, shipping has expanded dramatically in the 1500s, and since then the, the introduction uh, rate of new species have likely uh, dramatically increased. And, of course, the recent technical developments and technological developments in the 19th, 20th century has given uh, uh, rise to, to uh, intens intensifying this process and, and uh, has, has uh, resulted in several introductions. So this is just the past uh, 40 years uh, uh, picture how shipping has increased globally. And that's not only the question is not about, only about the ballast water, but also the mud and the sediments uh, in uh, the uh, ballast tanks up to half a meter. And this contains lots of uh, phytoplankton cysts, uh, benthic invertebrates and so forth. Some examples of early introductions. Uh, please don't read the, uh, the, try to read the uh, details in the table here and in coming slides, please check the paper for the details. As you can see, some of the early introductions go back to uh, 1200s and 1500s. Yeah, and probably the first ever uh, non-native species transferred by humans is Maya arenaria, which is common in the Baltic Sea. Recreational boating, relatively recent phenomenon, going back to a century ago, 1920s. And there are several evidences across the world how this actually has dramatically increased, mostly in, uh, in southern areas, but not, not only, also in Ireland, for instance. Southerly from the Baltic, but, but uh, geographically it's in temperate area. Life trade, as important often as shipping, uh, Romans have constructed uh, Austriaria already in the first century to rear, rear oysters. In the 11th century, there are evidences that, that uh, there were some oysters brought, uh, uh, from, uh, yeah, brought, brought from England and introduced to the modern sea. And uh, what is much better documented and what you think is a main thing, uh, maybe yes, maybe no, uh, that there are some early, uh, early uh, attempts to augment marine fish, fin fish product production, releasing hatched larvae, uh, 1870s, uh, where there are where specific uh, uh, factories established. So some of the examples, details are were given on the paper on uh, on Pacific oyster for rainbow trout, first introduced to the Germany in the uh, 19th century, then Rudi Tapas, and also, is it 
it, uh, is it uh, shrimp, yeah, white leg shrimp, 1970s, which is a big deal currently. This is uh, 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 <clears throat> shown on the right-hand side, uh, the, uh, the, the small prawn. Ornamental trade, maybe not is as important in, in temperate northern areas as in, in uh, tropical and subtropical areas. Some of the examples go back to uh, mid-19th century and so forth. So uh, those all indicate that it has a long history and, and canals. Canals, uh, the first canal was, was already built 6th century before Christ. And, and several, several canals connecting the Baltic uh, Sea and the Ponto-Caspian uh, basins, Black Sea and, and Caspian Sea, established uh, uh, mid-18th century. So those are all humans have created opportunities for species transfer by human aid. Suez Canal, the, uh, the uh, canal case globally. Uh, uh, connecting the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea, and resulting currently in almost weekly uh, introduction of new species to the Mediterranean Sea from the Red Sea. And this is exaggerated even in the current uh, uh, and the ongoing uh, uh, context of uh, climate change. So, uh, painting now the, now the time scale. It starts from the 13th, uh, 1300s and, and uh, uh, 2000s. Uh, examples of inter introductions, some of the examples from those previous uh, tables. Maya and Aria, then uh, uh, Mutilus uh, from South America to Europe, P Portugal and Spain, and uh, so, yeah, so, South, uh, so, so, South Euro Southern Europe, and uh, uh, the um, Oysters, then uh, some seaweed, Spartina to France, then Littorina, small snail, then uh, an another oyster, then uh, Kamchatka king crab. By the way, this is a this is a unique case globally. When uh, when uh, I think the Kamchatka king crab was uh, uh, deliberately transported by Russians from the. Uh, Bering Sea to Barents in 1960s. It has since then, to, to, uh, to increase the uh, fishing opportunities, it has uh, uh, increased in size, the stock. Now it's managed by Norwegians and Russians separately, uh, have di two different uh, uh, management regimes. Uh, in Norway, it's uh, uh, quota-based managed in, I think in Russia, they are not managed in quota based. So, and, and gives, uh, uh, gives is very valuable income for coastal communities. And then recently, mnemiopsis and, and many other things. Now, this is the, the, the some, some of the historically proven and unnegotiable evidences of introductions. What about the, what have scientists and observers have been doing? Some of the examples on, on dedicated service only since 1970s. Some rapid assessment surveys, Pacific Coast uh, North America, quantitative port service in Australia 1998, and quantitative falling panel service, also about the same time. Many disastrous in invasions have already occurred by then. Uh, examples of mo molecular tools. Please check the paper. Sorry, I have uh, I have very I have very vague uh, overview about the molecular <clears throat> uh, into the molecular uh, realm. But again, those advancements are relatively recent compared to what was already happened. How humans have changed the our ocean impact ev evaluation. Terrestrial people are saying, and there are. There, are, there is ongoing, uh, quite sharp discussion that alien species should be managed based on impacts. No, no way in the marine realm our knowledge is so fragmental that uh, it is simply impossible. Uh, also, there is IOCN is suggesting the environmental impact classification, impact, uh, classification for alien taxa, and this is the, their scheme. Alien species will, in marine realm will most qualify to data deficient. 
I think fisheries scientists know what means data deficient. Data poor, uncertainty is high, risk is high. Now, here are some examples on the, it's not impact, but it's how, how, uh, how abundant uh, and how massive some of the uh, aliens can be, including in the left, uh, left, uh, lower left side uh, can also cause injuries to humans. There was, there was an estimation, I think, about 15 years ago, there were, I don't remember which town in the North America, about 10,000 people died in one port town. And IMO, the International Maritime Organization, has said, uh, suggested that this is probably the cholera bacteria uh, transferred by, by um, uh, ballast water. So, change perception, very important in the, in the long-term perspective. And this all, uh, all the changes occurred to the evidence of huge negative impacts, causes of billions of dollars losses for economies, for instance, Dresena, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the zebra mussel, not, uh, not so much in the Baltic, but, uh, uh, but uh, essentially North America. Um, there are and will be forever long-standing dilemmas on overlooked invasions because the, our knowledge uh, about the occurrence and abundance biomass distribution of alien species at sea will remain uh, insufficient for a long time. A dilemma about the non-indigenous cryptogenic species for, uh, for early historical invasions, it is vitally impossible to Check it back whether whether which species uh, what, what, what a particular species was was introduced by humans or not, and uh, certainty of introduction pathways. This will remain. We have done the survey for the Baltic Sea recently uh, on the historical <coughs> uh, view, and uh, most of the introductions were uh, we were unable to allocate to uh, specific pathways. Remained possible. Not even likely, but possible. Direct evidence is only for the aquaculture or delib deliberate releases for species like uh, in the Baltic Sea during, I think, 50s and 60s. There were several, several species, North Pacific salmonids and sturgeons released purposefully to the Gulf of Riga, for instance. This qualifies as direct evidence. All the rest is either very likely or possible and often unknown. This is a management scheme until the border, uh, see the, see the uh, green uh, horizontal arrow, management ability, until the introduction, until the border, the management ability is high, meaning that uh, preventive measures, taking preventive measures is the only viable uh, solution uh, uh, <clears throat> to minimize the risk of introduction of non-native species. If, if the species is already introduced, then it mostly depends on the temperature and salinity, not so much about the food availability and, uh, and uh, predators, but basically the main hydroclimatic conditions. So, still some time. And now, uh, about the legislative part. Uh, please remember the time scale of the lower figure, lower panel, some key response actions. This starts from 1970. The first one was uh, International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, in, I think it was in 1970 or 69 or 71, uh, issued a couple of pages advice what to do to reduce the risk of adverse effects arising from introduction of marine non-native non species. And this was for the deliberate releases, not for accidental releases. Then uh, at some point was a first rapid assessment survey, scientific uh, activity, UNCLOS. The, the United Nations uh, Convention for the Law of the Sea is actually the first uh, binding uh, legal document, which says that states shall take all measures necessary to prevent, reduce, and control pollution 
of the marine environment resulting from the use of technologies under the jurisdiction control of the international accidental introduction of species. Then, uh, first, uh, ballast of the guidelines, uh, voluntary guidelines from IMO and uh, early 1990s, uh, but this was voluntary. And then two regulations. EU, uh, EU regulation on alien, uh, aliens in aquaculture. Uh, I think it was 2007 and update to 2008 or specifying regulation 2008 and there was a, one, one more follow-up uh, uh, amendment which I don't remember which year. And then EU uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, one, of the, one of the descriptors in non-native species. Uh, the initial uh, formulation was awfully bad uh, then in 2017, uh, uh, there was, uh, uh, there was uh, 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 revisiting a new document and uh, all the, the revised criteria actually are now quite good. So the primary aim is to, uh, the, uh, it's, it's now focused on uh, D2, Discover 2, non-native species, is as a pressure and number of uh, new species transferred by human aid during the assessment period, six years period, uh, is, is subjected then to the good environmental status assessment. And, and there will be now workshop in end of March to discuss what is guess, uh, what is the good environmental status and what will be non guess In the Baltic and the HELCOM, we have uh, agreed that, uh, at, that uh, it should be zero. So no new introductions of new species. By humans. So this is also written in the Helcom Botics Action Plan. But at the EU level, some countries are unhappy. So we will see what comes out. And then now there is an uh, International Ballast Water Management Convention is, uh, is now in force, and all countries should actually fill in this or follow this. So I think I'll stop here. There are a few other slides, but, uh, but that's not so important. Maybe the discussion is more important. We are almost there. So all the Baltic information for non-native species is freely avail available in this website called Aquanis. This was developed uh, uh, within one big EU project called Vectors and jointly with the ICS working group. And uh, essentially, the introduction events are annually updated, and it should be up to date. Uh, currently, there are 173 recorded alien species in the Baltic Sea, and about 60% of them is established. And about 20, 25, 26 species are those which are currently established in more than five countries in the Baltic Sea. So altogether, more than 170 recorded, and only, let's say, less than one third established at the, at the Baltic Sea wide scale. So thank you for your attention. I think I'll stop here and probably there are some questions. So not to run into the coffee break. Thank you. Any question? I have a question. Yes. What is your personal opinion? But really personal. Is yes. it really possible in nowadays to avoid invasive species? No, no, no. And this is this is uh, um, um, consensus understanding of the uh, <clears throat> of of uh, uh, international marine bioinvasion scientists. Uh, we cannot, eradication is not possible. What uh, eradication of already existing species in, is impossible. Control is unlikely. There are actually no evidences yet, even from freshwater areas. Uh, there, there was one, uh, one example in uh, River Mississippi, uh, maybe 10 years ago. And there, is, there are those big Asian carps. So the whole event costed $1 million. They closed all the waterway. I mean, uh, communicated with all the shipping companies, I mean, basically stopped the fishing for a uh, uh, shipping for a while, uh, then exploded all those carps, I mean, trolled it out, 
and, and discard it somewhere, utilize somewhere, somewhere. And in next year, there was even more carbs at the same place based on the uh, service. So no, this is impossible, but what only thing what you can do to pre take preventive measures to minimize the risk of new introductions. This is the only thing what we can do. And there are some positive examples. For instance, uh, Great Lakes have uh, actually implemented much more string stringent regulations than for is in by the Ballast Water Convention. And after that, there are no new uh, shipping mediated introductions to the Great Lakes. So some measures might work. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, Hen, for the very huge amount of information in your presentation. So I have a question also about your personal feeling about the Baltic Sea future capacity to hold maybe even more alien species. But maybe from the ecological perspective, do you see some gaps? or the alien species in the Baltic Sea? Uh, it was, I don't have a personal feelings. I, I can give you some <laughs> scientifically based opinions. I, I think the, the, uh, the early views from Erki Lepakoski and those times when I, was, I started also, and Erki was, was uh, one of my great I mean, teachers at the, and, uh, and, and introduced th this field. Uh, the, the view has uh, t uh, drastically changed. Uh, the, although the Baltic Sea is maybe species poor, the, the uh, food web interactions are so strong that, that uh, it is uh, quite difficult for new species to actually to come in and establish. Uh, it's more and more now, it's a discussion have uh, been going uh, in the direction of, of traits-based assessment, what are the functions uh, what, this, uh, what the ecosystem should fill in terms of ecological relations and maybe also the, the services. So, uh, and, and it's more relates actually, not so much whether they can, the system can, uh, can tolerate more species. Yes, I think it can. It more depends on the giving the opportunity for specific species which already uh, have uh, in their, their, their home range adapted to the, to the Quite, uh, quite peculiar uh, conditions in the Baltic Sea, uh, hydrological conditions, that if, uh, if they tolerate the system, they can actually survive. That there, there probably are niches there, but it's more, uh, more about human activities in terms of giving the opportunity, shipping or whatever canals, rather than whether a given system can host or cannot host. I think in case of Mediterranean Sea, I think we can clearly say that, that yes, it can host. Uh, yes, Maurice. Thanks, Ken. Just uh, what I understand that concerning Baltic, uh, we can find this species list in this uh, Aquanis yes. database. Yeah. But I have some questions concerning the uh, definitions. And when we are calling the, that is an alien species, and when it is, uh, for example, if you are to, uh, is it true that alien species are that able to establish sustainable population. Another thing is how to, with this climate change, if it is some species due to climate change, what never been observed in our area are coming and uh, establish population. Presence in the game region is due to in intentional or interna intentional introduction resulting from human activities. Uh, for instance, if a given species is alien species in the North Sea, comes to the Baltic by currents or swims, then it's also non-native in the Baltic Sea. It is called secondary invasion. If a given species is native in the, in the North Sea and again moves to the Baltic Sea, then it's, it's not alien species in the Baltic. It's vagrant species, or how it's called. It's not, uh, not uh, alien. But this discussion, actually, Maris, that's interesting discussion. There was recently a paper by terrestrial people who are calling those climate, uh, the, the, the range expanding species uh, of native species due to climate change as neo-natives. Neo I, would, I would say this only blurs the picture. 
But, for instance, the grand old marine by invasion guy, Jim Carlton, thinks also that we should deal with that, we should not ignore that, and, and, and in this regard, there are some contrasti contrastingly different views. Okay, thank you. We need to move forward. Yes. Thank you for your very nice uh, uh, in coffee break, sorry. Hi. In coffee break, we need to we move can, forward. There will be a coffee break and then a lunch break and he will be here. So use him whenever you need. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So now I would like to give floor to Evers and uh, he will talk about the future in Baltic Sea. The floor is yours. Um, I need my presentation. Okay. <clears throat> good evening, uh, good, good morning, uh, colleagues and guests. So I have a quite nice opportunity to give my presentation after two legendary men in field of marine science. So it will be not an easy task for me, taking into account the complexity of this study, the quite limited time slot and my English skills. But I will try to do my best to give you some, some, some understandable and nice story about the Baltic Sea future trends, particularly the Gulf of Riga. So basically this work is the outcome from the bonus uh, Blue Webs project that already Andres mentioned before. So basically this is one of the project subtasks. So we created food web model for the Gulf of Riga and made the future simulations, how it will look like. Basically, don't take it very seriously. It's still a game. It's still not maybe very real realistic, but it showed some very interesting information and signals to us. So basically, I will try to very briefly describe the ECOPASS modeling concept. So basically, there are two things. ECOPASS, this is standing uh, model that describes the, the like steady state of the ecosystem and ecosystem, it is, it is dynamic model that already uh, describes some spatial and, and, and temporal changes if you are using, for example, ecospace co component of this model. So basically, all of you, I assume, know well where the Gulf of Riga is. So basically, this modeling uh, approach quantifies the ecosystem in some borders and it is not two-dimensional borders. Basically, you can treat this ecosystem like three-dimensional box. And within this box, there are a lot of components that are living, interacting together, and make those all things quite complicated from time to time. So basically, we have the food web components, we have the anthropogenic pressures, fisheries, and also we have some climate impact also. And so our task is to somehow quantify all those relationships, make them dynamic, and here is a bit technical slide. So basically we set this uh, base model for the Gulf of Riga ecosystem for five years period from 2000 to 2004. This model consisted of 27 functional groups. Actually many of those groups uh, are on species level, some of them are collections of species, but basically the, this term functional groups means that these are separate species or some collections of species that share some similar population dynamics and ecological function in the ecosystem. So basically everything depends on our knowledge and our data av availability to divide those groups. So basically here, for the base model, we need information on species biomass in comparable measurements. For example, here, these are tons per square kilometer. Then we need information for the diet composition, for the production rate. Here in models, it go, for the model, it goes like production biomass ratio. Then we need to understand what is the annual consumption from the ecosystem for this functional group. What's the impact of this functional group in the ecosystem in terms of consumption 
And then very important uh, factor is mortality, especially if we are talking about the commercial fish species. So this, this is definitely fishery that creates large fraction of mortality. And in this model, we divided this fishery into four fleets, trolls, trapnets, pots, and gillnets. So basically for every fleet, we are also um, assuming some fishing mortality level within this analyzed time period. And uh, yeah, this is very secret information, some sensitive coefficients. Basically, when we created this model, we used the data from uh, our institute, BIOR, and we used also data sets from the Latvian Institute of Aquatic Ecology. And for these coefficients, there are a lot of literature-based evidence behind. So basically, for every number, we need some clear reference where it comes from. After the setting base model, we need to check this model consistency against ecological criteria. There is so-called pre-ball uh, discipline that you are doing. Basically, you are evaluating all those coefficients and uh, functional group responses and the interactions, whether they are ecologically sound or not. So after this pre-ball diagnostics, you can state that you are done with your base model and you can move further. So here I just briefly will show you some, some nice graphs. Here is the uh, biomass distribution in the steady state ecopass model. So basically, this Gulf of Riga ecosystem, this is quite a unique ecosystem that is influenced by large amount of fresh water from inflowing rivers, and the salinity level is quite low. And as a result, the abundance and diversity of marine species are lower when we compare this ecosystem to the central Baltic Sea. So and here, is, as you can see, in this period when, when, we, when we performed this analysis, analysis uh, the zoobantus and phytoplankton were the dominant groups in the steady state ecosystem model. So here comes the diet composition you need to, actually this is the key factor that uh, links together all those functional groups. So basically based on the uh, wet weight distribution in stomachs, we are assigning for each functional group the main food items. Basically, this is the fraction in the diet. Uh, this is also verified by the field surveys and by literature stuff. Here you can see for the seals there's some wide gap that stands for the consumption fraction, for the diet fraction that comes from other components, from salmonids, from some other fishes that are not included in this model. And finally, this is quite nice, nice, nice picture of overall ecosystem components. Uh, these components are um, here. You can see th there are several trophic levels. So we, we have top predators, we have some uh, primary producers, and these lines thickness re represents the energy flow intensity. So the thicker is line, the intense, more intense energy flow comes from one group to another group. So this is for the steady state model. But we need and we want to make some future simulations. In order to do the future simulations, we need to have some kind of drivers in our ecosystem. And here, we use also our knowledge and available information to assign some drivers that can affect our ecosystem. Namely, this is a fishing effort, for example, that affects the performance of the fishing fleet. So we, we, we uh, characterize fishing effort like relative fishing hours, in terms of relative fishing hours. And then we have a list of abiotic forcing functions that came from the Baltzem model. This is large scale eutrophication model for the Baltic Sea. And actually, you can uh, get some, some estimates for the, some, some sub-basins of the Baltic Sea for separate depth zones and so on. So basically, we find the driver for phytoplankton production rate. We find driver for the warm water zooplankton species. This was an annual temperature. And we found some uh, factor that affects so-called cold water species that are also sensitive to environmental ch changes in the Gulf of Riga. So basically, these are the driving factors behind the ecosystem. And here you can see uh, the changes during cal calibration time. Calibration time was uh, 11 years, from 2004 to 2014. Basically, the first year is the baseline. Everything is on level one. And then you can see the relatively 
how, how these factors are changing along. So the idea, finally, from this exercise is to get those model predicted variables as close as possible to observed value, values. So basically, as you can see, it works for some of the groups. For some of the groups, we are not so successful yet. But basically, if we are concentrating on more important groups from the food web perspective, it's, it's phytoplankton, it's, it's abundant zooplankton groups, and uh, the herring. So basically, we can quite closely catch those trends that are going on during those calibration period. Uh, after this calibration, of course, this is not only visual checking, there are some coefficients behind, like sum of squares and a cake information criteria and so on. Basically, we are evaluating our model and setting the base model for the future simulations. And for the future simulations within the Blue Webs project, actually, we, we had some uh, different scenarios. One scenario was uh, related Actually, two scenarios was related to climate change, uh, RCP45 and RCP85. Just uh, briefly, RCP5, RCP85 stands for the warmer climate. Actually, both of those scenarios st states that climate will become warmer in the future, as we can see in this winter also. Uh, then we have two nutrient scenarios, Baltic Sea Action Plan and present nutrient loads. Then three fishing scenarios uh, decreasing uh, by 50% increasing uh, in 100% and status quo that is average from the last three years period. Then invasives, round goby was put like invasive species in this ecosystem model. So basically we have one scenario boom bust like biomass is going up and then dropping. Then uh, the second was is more, the second one is more extreme uh, the dynamics uh, carrying capacity to carrying capacity level. Basically, we set around Gobi biomass comparable to all other species together. So basically, this is huge amount of round gobies there. And the third one is model produced val value. And the last two, three scenarios was related to round gobi impact. In this ecosystem model, you can assign uh, the impact uh, strength for the round gobi. Basically. From the top-down perspective, there can be extreme top-down impact when increase in round gobi biomass will increase the consumption of food items. Then it, there is an alternative uh, scenario that, that there could be even no top-down effect. And the third one is from the model calibration. So basically, we finished with 180 combinations by multiplying all those scenarios. And basically, this also means that we, we created 108 models. For the, four scenario, for the four scenarios of climate and nutrients, we need to do uh, model calibration. That is also quite extensive uh, discipline. And here is the look into the future on those uh, factors that affect the food web. Here are two uh, climate scenarios and two nutrient loads. Basically, the red and the yellow stands for the warmer climate, and uh, the bluish color stands for the bit, 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 uh, not so warm climate. And as you can see, here's the baseline. The, this dotted line is year 2014, and you see that basically everything went up more than twofold, even in some cases. So basically, we are expecting the increase in temperatures, we are expecting increase in pr uh, productivity. And we are expecting that also this, this, this oxygen level during summertime in deeper layers will uh, maybe will, will decrease in future. And this is maybe the most important slide from this presentation. The future scenario trends, uh, basically, from the functional group perspective, uh, I also added small pictures for those functional groups. But basically, to conclude everything, uh, Many things in the food web depends on the primary production. When primary production goes up, uh, we can see clear response from the zooplankton groups, and we can, clear we can see clear response also from the top predator groups. So basically, uh, in co when we compare these uh, results with the baseline, so it, it, it is huge, huge difference. More specific, here is one climate scenario and one uh, 
Newton at Lowe's scenario, optimistic one, so let's be optimists. And there are different types of fishing activities. The red one is when fishing will decrease. The blue one is that fishing will stay on the current level. And the red one is that fishing will increase. So basically what we can see here, I was a bit shocked when I made this picture. It was Christmas time. And basically, I thought that there will be some clear effect. But as you can see, there's almost no effect on the food web. And I even know why it is like that. Uh, what is interesting, we can see if we are talk, talk, uh, looking at the young herring group, we can see some positive response when fishing will increase. So basically, this is related to some interspecies relationships and com competition, because young herring is not so vulnerable to fishery. And when older herring is fishing out, is being fishing out, so younger herring has, has larger survival rate. But basically, to get confidence that model is not wrong, I made additional scenario. This is the step outside the Blue Web's project plans. I made scenario of extreme fishing. What, what will happen if we will fish more than 50 times more than nowadays? And the results suggest that uh, many commercial fish species will extinct, but one more time, the response to other trophic levels was very weak. So I need a bit rush in my presentation. Here is the scenarios of the round gobbies. And also about round gobbies, we can see when round gobby will increase, the effect will be positive to the top predators, but the other food web components, the effect is minor. And if we are looking at the, this top-down or bottom-up effects, then when we are moving and uh, changing these coefficients, we can see that there could be potential situation that when round gobby can deplete muscle biomass. Sorry, it's too, too much information for 50 or 20 minutes, minutes presentation, so thanks for attention. I see a lot of future uh, uh, possibilities to develop these models and to use it into the ecosystem approach in the Baltic Sea, managing. Thanks, sorry. Thank you, Ivers. Uh, we have a uh, time for a very, very short question. One? One question? Do I need? Oh, oh good. Uh, concerning the birds, uh, we already discussed uh, uh, about these, uh, the top predators, with seals, cod and, and birds, they are show very similar design. What kind of birds and is used, uh, information from what kind of birds is used in your model? Uh, these are fish-eating birds, uh, mostly gulls and cormorants, and uh, this model cannot be very precise on groups that depends also on the feeding outside the model ecosystem. So actually these birds can feed also in some coastal lakes and so on. So basically this, this can be fake signal. And I also would like to warn fisheries managers that are present here not to clap hands and not to be very happy without, just, just keep in mind that this is just a game. Under climate change, the things can interact the different and it depends on our calibration scenario, basically, we didn't, we, we can not predict the changes that will happen under such complete changes in the ecosystem, the combination, it will, will, be, will be, we don't know. It's completely new regime shift, it seems. Okay, thank you. Please give applause to Evers. And now I would like to invite Robertus, our Lithuanian colleague, who will tell us something what we... No, okay. we don't have time, sorry, <laughs> I'm strict. Uh, so he will give a talk about something what we have common in Baltic states, so the floor is yours. Hello. Well, I suppose I will be quite short with my presentation and won't get into the coffee break that much. Uh, I, well, 
don't know actually what is the public, so I didn't bother to put that much genetic material into that, just the, the results. So, but I think that will be interesting what we're going to present. And our, actually, uh, what we're going to present, so the study that has been done on river lampreys, which is quite important local fish stock, although they don't count, account for very much of biomass in the Baltic seas. So what we do have, well, general facts about lampreys, and there's in the world 30, 41, 44, five now species, 22, 26 of them are not parasitic, and the other goes to feed to larger water bodies on fish, the parasitic creatures. In Lithuania and Latvia, currently we have four species. It's the uh, river lamprey, which we are dealing with, brook lamprey, a paired species or satellite species of brook, river lamprey, sea lamp, occasional migrant sea lamprey, and uh, quite newly discovered cryptic species, Ukrainian lamprey. Uh, okay, maybe a, big, a bit of background uh, before why we started with this study. So at first we looked at a very rough scale, so it's mitochondrial, mitochondrial genes, cytochrom B. Uh, what, what, we, uh, what, we, what we found uh, that we don't have any diversity according to this gene in southeastern Baltic. So, and even no differences between those two cryptic species, uh, brook and river lamprey. When we looked to, to a different mitochondrial gene, so it's not encoding gene uh, one, or non encoding region one, uh, which accounts for around 90% of uh, total mutations in mitochondria. And we received already some bigger, you know, difference here, differences here, and we managed to had a network of five uh, haplogroups, which quite interestingly show, well, which showed us uh, the way of recolonization of Baltic Sea after the last ice age, let's say if, uh, when it was opened, 10 years, 10,000 years ago, so that the it implies that Iberian Peninsula, actually for a long time probably, was a refugia for river lamprey, and there was a few cases of recolonization of Northern Europe and Baltic Sea. And we have here in Baltic Sea quite a mix of those haplotypes in, in the studies river before. So, as we understood that we are quite, uh, deep in the dark and don't know actually very much about our Baltic population, especially uh, uh, national populations. Uh, what we knew that there's only a difference between Baltic Sea and populations outside the Baltic Sea. So we had an initiative uh, with Bjor, with colleagues Bjor, uh, and the Finnish Fund for Nature to look into that and how to secure our quite valuable resource. Uh, so in 2018, we applied for the uh, funding to Latlid Interreg uh, program and to a lot of surprise, we received that. <laughs> yeah, the, the study area for this project is Kurujeme region and Kleipeda and Tilshe district. And you know why is lamprey? As I said already, we are we are quite we were we knew that we don't know quite a lot about, and there we are becoming quite uh, valuable uh, size or quite valuable catch. Uh, at the moment, they are the second um, most expensive fish stock or fish fish species after eel. And you know, as a lot of now uh, EU legislations drives towards more sustainable uh, management of fish fish stock and to to secure the the sustainable 
uh, usage or, and catch. So we'll try to somehow look what is the this uh, management unit. Uh, the first assumption was that actually all the Baltic should be one management unit for the Baltic as Helcom gave its assessment for River Lamprey on all Baltic basis, basin and it was near threatened, but we didn't observe that. We considered our population to be on a quite good, on a quite good status. And yeah, the the project, the actually the main aim of the project was to uh, deliver or to to show to have a look what is the man possible management units, and to base our strategy for uh, management, maintenance, and conservation on those on the, those data. And now to the actual studies. So we studied. Uh, 11 rivers, or 12, it could be considered as 12, uh, from Grebo River to the Namunas Basin. And what we found, well, actually, I want to just to remind you some uh, assumptions of uh, hardy weinberg equilibrium. So it's random reproduction, large population, random mating, no immigration, or immigration and no mutation. So what we found that from this, those assumptions that uh, populations in the area that we looked into are on a very, on a quite good status from the molecular perspective or genetic perspective. Uh, what we maybe found quite interesting that in Venta uh, River we had uh, yeah, the genetic, diver genetic diversity higher than expected. And it's only one explanation possible that there is some isolated population there that is comp constantly mixing with the natural or the other one. And actually that could be really true because might, uh, we have the Inkuldiga uh, uh, rapid, which is there for already some 5,000 years. And probably if you have some kind of maybe uh, subspecies already of, of brook lamprey up, up si upstream the Venta uh, rumba. And yeah, and yeah, but the final results, uh, most important results of our study, which we are basing our now guidelines for for management, so this is quite interesting actual data and needs more explanation. Uh, up in the table, uh, in the upper tab table, you see some fi fixation values (FST) uh, that shows genetic differentiation between river populations, and we sampled actually in Latvia and Lithuania uh, lampreys at the same time in the same year, but in different times. So in Lafina we sim sampled in the springtime from spring ground, and in Latvia it was sampled in autumn from co commercial fisheries. So actually it's two different spring grounds, runs. And what we see here that there's quite So what it implies that there is also separation by time. So that uh, every uh, spring run could be looked at as a subdivision. So if we, you know, the, if we overfish one run, or there's some stochastic, stochastic factors that interact with it, so there should be probably a rippling effect in the future in the fish stock, in the lamprey stock. And when we corrected the values uh, for this uh, uh, different spring grounds, so we got that there's no differentiation in uh, Lithuanian, pop among Lithuanian populations and populations which are inhabiting uh, west coast of Kurjami region. Uh, and actually we are quite interested and concerned that probably 
Well, as we expect that there's no natal homing, but probably some geographic factors as gulfs, uh, estuaries, uh, archipelagos could work as uh, limiting factors for migration. And we are really uncertain on what we find, but it seems that in the Gulf of Riga there could be some already different management stock. Yes, so maybe what, what, you know, what is needed, so maybe on the basis of that, we propose that there is a need for uh, cross-border management. So we, cons we consider that uh, at, the, at the current situation of the, this stock is in good status from a molecular, molecular perspective, and that there is no natal homing that so that means what means that uh, lamprey, if it is spawn if in one river, it could co go b back and forth from Lithuania to Latvia, and there's no no differ difference for for lamprey where it will land for spawning. So you know if the lampreys are overcatch in Latvia, so it will interact with the population in Lithuania and vice versa. And in Lithuania, we have quite now an urge to increase the fishing pressure on lamprey as they are becoming more and more expensive every year. Uh, uh, yes, so as I mentioned, one population in Lithuania and Kurzem on the western coast. And what we didn't expect that it is uh, in, in relation between the uh, spring runs. That means that every spring run should be dealt as a separate sub. sub Sub-management units. Okay, thank you very much. I I hope that you w were interested, <laughs> and I am. I would really be glad to receive some questions. Are you? Yeah. Okay. So questions. <laughs> One. Oh. oh. Sorry. Hello, Roberto. So can you tell a bit more about the uh, differences of Latvia and of Venta population? Sorry? Of uh, Venta population? Yeah, upstream Rumba. What, upstream Rumba, what, yes. what, what does it mean from a scientific point of view? And from, from scientific point of view? Well, if we deal with conservation, you know, it's now going up, you know, to con like new tendencies is to conserve not only species, but genetic diversity as well. So from this perspective, maybe, you know, the, uh, there should be more attention to the population upside Rumba, as it could be unique population there in all Baltic region. Or maybe there even could be more such populations which are uh, isolated for quite a long already period, which probably are present as well in, in tributaries in Lithuania and could be as well in Latvia. More? I can count on you. Yeah. Just a question. When I understood from your genetic studies and what it is in the open sea coast in Latvia and, uh, and Lithuania, this mm -hmm. is one population, mm -hmm. as it is no homing for lamprey. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that overfishing in one river, if it's occurred in one area, it's it not so dangerous for whole population if, if in other rivers it's not? Actually, yes, probably that would imply that overfishing in one river would cause not that big damage in the rest of the population. And you know what's very interesting that in Latvia the current management system is uh, already present for some 200 years. And we also, under this project, looked into fishing mortality, which is up to 40%. We also studied one river in Lithuania, which is, gave, us, gave us the almost the same values. So the, what it implies that uh, liver lamp population is, can be sustained under this quite high fishing pressure, and they still be in good, good shape. One other thing, maybe you can, uh, what's for me was new with spring runs. What, uh, can you elaborate it? Does it mean that, because in Latvia, what I know, that lampreys are start to come to rivers somewhere in 
second half of summer. Yes. What is with spring August, runs? Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, the spring runs, I had in mind talking about that, that it's uh, the individuals that different, different individuals that spawn in different years. Because we collected in the, the spawners from the spawning sites in spring, and then we collected from the fisheries in autumn, which would spawn another spring. So in two subsequent years. Mm -hmm. uh, Robertus, I, I know that, but I want to, as you, you say to another, if uh, Lamprey do not have homing, how they choose river where to enter? Why they are choosing Daugava? Daugava? <laughs> uh, well, precisely why they choose Daugava, I can't say, but I just can say on maybe comment a bit on mechanism how they choose. And probably it's associated, most probably it's associated with the forage uh, or targets the species. It could be caught, it could be uh, spread, hearing, uh, flounder. And some of them uh, tend to migrate, so it could uh, act as vectors for their transportations. And of course, lampreys, when they are already they are triggered by the uh, spawning migration, so probably they choose the nearest freshwater river that they come across. More? No? Enough? I think it's enough. Thank you, Robertis. So we can give applause now. Uh, thank you. And now it's time for poster session and coffee break. Please use time for discussions and please also see all the posters. And uh, we uh, meet here at 11.40. Yeah, yeah.
And we will continue with our next presentations. And uh, Ines will uh, tell some story about uh, seals. It's a really hot topic in Latvia. If we go to some meetings with coastal fishermen, it doesn't matter what is written in agenda, because in, in the end of the day, we are discussing about seals. Ines? Thank you very much. Yeah, I saw the button. Can I move this a little bit? Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so today I'm going to try to tell you in a very simple language about uh, what's happening at the moment in Latvia and uh, in the communities of coastal fishermen. Uh, because uh, in the last decade, uh, seals have uh, learned how to adapt to fishermen habits. Um, basically, they have done a lot of damage to the fishermen and fishermen livelihoods. And, um, and that's why we are trying to assess that damage done to them, uh, to somehow come up with the ideas how to help them. And that's why our the aim of the research is to evaluate the, uh, the seal depredation on fishing gear and catch, uh, as well as uh, to provide a scientific recommendation for compensation mechanisms in Latvia. Because other Baltic Sea countries have already these compensa uh, compensation mechanisms, but uh, Lat in Latvia we're still working on it. And so, um, in Latvian coastal and in general in Latvian waters, uh, we have uh, uh, two seal species uh, visiting us. Uh, one of them is ringed seal. Uh, we have up to 500 visitors uh, per year uh, from the West Estonian archipelago. Uh, they usually come into the central uh, part of Gulf of Riga for just feeding. We, in Latvian waters, we don't have uh, no haulouts or no breeding areas. Uh, and uh, just because they don't, uh, these uh, seal species uh, uh, don't come so close to the coast, uh, they have a minor effect on this conflict. But the real trouble, uh, and about the numbers, excuse me, about the numbers, so uh, uh, from annual surveys, uh, HELCOM data shows that in the last 30 years, uh, uh, ringed seal uh, species uh, numbers have um, uh, grown a lot. Uh, but we're going to go further to the, to the uh, bigger troublemakers, which uh, is gray seal. Uh, we have up to 3,000 visitors per year, uh, and just as well as ringed seal, uh, they don't come here for uh, haul oats or uh, breeding, but they just come to feed here, and why they are the ones which do the biggest damage, because they have learned um, how to eat the fish out of the fishermen's uh, fishing gear, as well as uh, how to even follow the sounds of the boat motors. Uh, and um, and uh, annual surveys in the molting season uh, have, uh, have counted approximately 30,000 uh, individuals in Baltic Sea region. Um, in 2017, but the last data, uh, unofficial data, uh, from uh, Finland and Sweden uh, uh, is saying that uh, we already have in 2019 40,000 to 60,000 individuals uh, living in the Baltic Sea. Uh, so, and to somehow uh, illustrate the everyday realities, uh, fishermen must uh, confront here are some pictures, and uh, the emphasis is on the lower right, left picture, no, right picture, uh, uh, where we can see in the boat two dead seals and one small box of the fish in the catch, which begs for a question, what do we fish, uh, seals or fish themselves? So, yeah, seals and coastal fishery. So seals are uh, the main problem facing uh, over fisheries, uh, especially with the passive gear. Uh, and uh, because of the damage done to the fishing gear and reduced catches, um, do we have any solutions? Uh, basically, what we, what we have, uh, we have mitigation measures. And uh, one part of the mitigation measures is uh, our 
are technical options, seal safe gear or uh, acoustic scaring devices, but um, they haven't shown long-term effects on keeping seals away from the fishing gear. Uh, that's why uh, this option is possible, but not the best case scenario at the moment. Then there is protective hunting, uh, which uh, is still under the discussions because uh, it's a very controversial topic. Um, and uh, before we can discuss it in Latvian waters, we need to have a working seal management plan. But at the moment, what uh, we can do in Latvian situation and what we are trying to do is uh, uh, putting our uh, attention to economic compensation schemes and um, trying to come up with the ways how to evaluate the compensation amounts. And that's why we're going further to the topic about the fishing gears. Uh, basically, uh, from the information from uh, fishery logbooks and from the questionnaires from fishermen, uh, the, sh the data shows that the biggest damage is done to the eel pout fike nets, trap nets, and gill nets, as you can see in the graph. Uh, and that's mostly due to the seal's selective feeding habits. Uh, they choose specific fish, uh, fish which can be caught in the, all these fishing gears. Um, and uh, for example, no significant damage is done to the round gobby trap nets because seals just, uh, as from our experience, just don't like uh, round gobbies. And uh, pound nets uh, are open stationary fishing gears and that's why seals can easily um, get into the fishing gear. Uh, have their dinner, get out, and no da damage done to the fishing gear, and seals are happy and fishermen are not. Uh, but uh, the damage done to the fishing gears highly depends on the intensity of the, of, on the, fishi of the fishing, because, um, because uh, we have heard already uh, like from fishermen a lot of talk about uh, that they don't go fishing anymore because uh, the damage will be bigger if they're going to put, for example, gill nets in than if they're not going to fish at all. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the calcu uh, we calculated the damage done to the fishing gear compared to the turnover, which is basically nine from uh, from nine to seventeen percent uh, from all over overall uh, amount uh, of fish. And um, and as we can see from interviews and uh, and. Uh, uh, logbook information, uh, mostly the damage is done to these three fishing gears and the total loss uh, in catch and fishing gear is shown from uh, 28 to 59 percent as you can see on the right side uh, in the column of uh, percentages uh, and that's why we have uh, advised to, uh, to, do, uh, to do the compensation scheme in this way that uh, we uh, calculate the damage fishing gear uh, together with the log, uh, lost catch, which is approximately 38% from the total amounts of, uh, of landings in those different gears. Uh, and um, separately, uh, herring pound net uh, compensation amounts is 20%, uh, which we have taken an exa uh, example from Estonian research and studies where they have a, um, uh, come to conclusion that uh, seals are doing uh, tw 20 to 50 percent of the damage to herring pound nets. And um, as for round gobby trap nets, uh, we are uh, advising to give a 10 percent uh, of the compensation, which is half of the herring pound nets, because we don't have uh, um, scientific research yet to tell uh, the different number. Um, yeah, and about the structure of seal inflicted damage on ca catch. So we have basically three parts. One part is landing. Uh, the second and um, mid part uh, is a uh, lost catch, uh, which can which is calculable. Uh, but the but the biggest uh, monster in our case is the hidden damage. Hidden damage is the part of the fish uh, which has been lost uh, from the fishing gear without a trace. And uh, in Latvia, uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, specific research on that, but Swedish scientists uh, have uh, uh, done experiments where they leave um, 
uh, different fish in the nets and mark them and then just leave them for a night into the waters and then see which fish have, uh, are, are gone from the fishing net without trace. And uh, their estimations are that on every, for example, every whitefish and pike perch uh, in the fishing gear, uh, two individuals have been lost. Uh, for cod, the proportion is uh, 1 to 3.5 individual, individuals. And for herring, it's 1 to 20 individuals. So on each herring in the, uh, in the gear, 20 herring individuals have been lost. Um, and um, we uh, uh, have, uh, from, uh, from five uh, contract uh, fishermen, we, had, uh, we have done a research on, uh, on the damage done to the species. Uh, which, which we can see here, and we can see that um, uh, seals uh, like to, uh, to eat and to take away the, uh, mostly the salm salmonoid fish uh, species, and you can see that the numbers are growing, and that, uh, that basically almost uh, approximately half of the fish have been lost, uh, have been lost to, to the seal damage uh, um, every year basically, and yeah, it's growing. And that's probably because of the, as well, because uh, just seals like uh, highly nutritional fish rather than, um, than less nutritional fish. Huh. Yeah, so our conclusions after these last three year research uh, is that the first and foremost is uh, the quality of data is still questionable uh, because to a great extent uh, the data is done um, uh, the data is based on the fisheries uh, logbooks and not always fishermen are uh, filling those logbooks uh, honestly and fairly um, and um, unlike other Baltic Sea countries where they are basing their uh, compensation mechanisms on, uh, on the income from the landings. Uh, we are advising to base this mechanism on the amount, amount of landings by fish species. And um, the research shows that the dam damage uh, done to the fish catch um, should be compensated to uh, highly, uh, uh, highly economical value fish uh, as 38%, which is yeah, salmon, sea trout, whitefish, and so on. Uh, herring garfish, 20%, and round goby and flounder, 10% uh, compensation from the landings. And um, the last conclusion we came to that there is definitely not one universal solution to how to help fishermen and mitigate the seal impact, uh, but we should rather focus on the mixture of different approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Please, if you have some questions to me or hopefully my colleague Maris will be able to help. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Norman Srekstinch, uh, Director of the Fisheries Department of the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, it's more a comment. Uh, there was in the presentation the mitigation measures and there is the economical compensations. Uh, we are working on this very hardly and thank the Institute for uh, data offered uh, to, to work out uh, this uh, proposal for compensations. But uh, from my point of view, I couldn't see it as a mitigation measure. It's a no reduce uh, of the seal presence. Uh, possibly we could go vice versa, that the more seals, it's a better than the fishermen sitting in the sofa and getting uh, compensations. Yeah and uh, it's uh, just a feeding device for seals and there is no any economic in, uh, uh, income for a fisherman. Uh, therefore, I, I couldn't uh, count this as a mitigation measure. It's a post factum that we are trying uh, to pay to the fishermen the losses, but we are not solving the problem interaction between seals and uh, fisheries with this uh, compensation mechanisms. As, uh, for fishermen, there is no intention to find uh, the solutions, uh, the new gears, uh, to change the gears and so on, if they're getting the money uh, just in cash uh, for, for a seal presence in the Baltic Sea. Thank you. Maybe I, uh, can I ask a normal new question? How it is, <coughs> because <coughs> uh, where is some proposal from uh, your department concerning 
uh, with uh, compensations. How it is developing and what is the status presently? Can the fishermen expect something this year occurred or what is your... Yes, uh, I think it's a question uh, as a from fisherman side, but uh, not from institute. But uh, anyway, uh, we are very close to pass as a regulation to the Council of Minister uh, for consideration and approval. And this year, uh, in the springtime, we hope that the fishermen could apply for compensation for a previous year for a, for a last year's landings. Thank okay. you. One more. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I would a bit follow up what, what Normals was saying that in terms of by invasions and managing the round copy, I would uh, totally disagree in terms of, of, of some compensation uh, for seal damage if, they, if seals are eating round copy. But the question is that uh, I'm, I'm one of the seal friends, not the real specialist, so please excuse if the question is stupid. I have understood that basically at the population level, seals are mostly eating the most abundant fish, which is herring and sprat. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what is a proportion of those bad seals, which are actually sitting in the coastal areas and, and uh, targeting coastal fishermen? So it's certainly not the 100%. Can you estimate how, what is a proportion of those, those specific uh, gray seals which uh, cause you trouble? Hmm. Uh, Mari, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, uh, as far as my knowledge goes, uh, it's uh, pretty impossible to say uh, what is the amount of the seals that are doing the biggest damage, because there could be one seal who's doing damage to half of the seas uh, shoreline fishermen, and then there could be like some parts where there are like um, many seals uh, doing the same damage to some smaller part of the, like for example, to ten fishermen's fishing gear. So. But please, Mari, uh, add to that. That's how far Maybe one, I am informed. One comment. Uh, yeah, it is some theory, but there is some uh, seals, gray seals, big males, which is specialized for eating from fishing gears. But it is, what I found, it is only one publication. But removal of these seals can help. But uh, uh, in same time, there is in some countries allowed the uh, protecting hunting, and this is not helping. It's helping for one, at least Swedish experience shows, but it's helped for one, two days. And when the seals from neighboring areas are coming to the feeding, so we, uh, we plan to make if the protective hunting will go in Latvia, we will try to introduce some project and check also with specialized feeding stuff. But I am not sure that the result will be quite successful. Thank you. And if I may add a little bit uh, 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 before you ask a question as well, is that fundamentally I have the understanding that uh, uh, like um, seals are animals and we as human beings are trying to uh, push animals somewhere where they don't understand when they're, where they're trying to be pushed either by any mitigation measures. So I would say on my opinion, subjective opinion, uh, we should uh, change the habits of the humans who have consciousness. Uh, like fundamentally, it's just that problem I think is a little bit yeah, complicated in that sense. Well, actually, it's now a comment, became a comment. Yeah. But I totally agree with you. And I just give an example of our compensation system in Lithuania. Of course, it could work better. It's based on Finnish system. Hmm. It's uh, from the uh, catch income, catch income based. But there's some part which accounts for what, how they get. If they show that they are trying to deal to reduce this uh, damage themselves. It's either, you know, purchasing this uh, seal-safe pontoon traps, either having some selection windows or, or not selection windows, uh, or windows to stop, you know, getting off seals into the fishing gear and so on. Of course, it's, it doesn't work for, for gillnets. Yeah, mm. yep. Okay, enough. Thank you. <laughs> Give applause to Ines. Thank you.
And now it is my pleasure to invite our next speaker, Didis, who will tell us a story. I hope it's not a bedtime story. It depends. I will try to continue the same line what uh, started Hen in the morning about uh, invasive and non-native species. We have some story about Ron Gobi in Latvia. We believe we are a little bit special in Latvia. How we are uh, doing and uh, what we are doing with Ron Gobi. And what is Ron Gobi? Ron Gobi is a non-native species from uh, Caspian and from uh, Black Sea. Uh, first time we observed uh, Ron Gobi in uh, Poland, in G Gulf of Gdansk in 1990. Uh, some 40, 15 years later, we found first time in uh, Latvia. It was close to Liepais, and one year later, it was also in Gulf of Riga. I think it's the same in uh, Estonian waters. And uh, Currently, is considered one of the top invasive species in the Baltic Sea. And uh, it has been established in all Baltic Sea sub-basins. And actually, if you look on map, this map is official map from Helcom. I would say all maps of uh, Ron Gobi distribution is outdated. I remember we had one symposium about Gobis. It was in uh, Umeo in Sweden. And the expert from Great Lakes explained, if you define some habitat, what is not suitable for Ron Gobi, for sure you will find next year in that habitat Ron Gobi. And uh, at least in Latvian waters, we could see in all coastal habitats, Ron Gobi is almost everywhere. We could see also in some rivers and even in some lakes. Uh, as far as we know, in Latvia is the highest commercial landings on Ron Gobi. Till 2018, we had a really sharp and strong increase of uh, landings. We saw the same signals, the same results in our scientific surveys in coastal. And then suddenly something happened in 2019. We believe we know what's happened. We will see it later. And actually, this Ron Gobe fishery is quite specific. We have some really good hotspots of Ron Gobe fishery. It's uh, from Liepāja to south. It's close to Lithuanian uh, border. In uh, Rutsa, Vanica, Liepāja districts, we are catching more or less 60, 17, in some years even 90. A percent of total landings than we have in the uh, west part of uh, Gulf of Riga, uh, Ruoja, Kaltene. This is good fishing place and also in some eastern uh, coast of Gulf of Riga. But still, uh, results from scientific surveys, also from uh, commercial logbooks, indicates that the uh, abundance of Ron Gobis is in Gulf of Riga is much more lower than in open sea. Uh, commercial fishing on Ron Gobi is really specific. They are, fishermen are fishing uh, Ron Gobi starting from mid of April till midsummer, end of June. Uh, it's a period before spawning time when the fish are really uh, active, they are migrating because most of fishing gears are passive fishing gears. If you look on landings, it was different between open part and Gulf of Riga. If we, we also see there are some differences in biology. Uh, round, of, round gobi in Gulf of Riga are smaller because fishermen actually are aiming for round gobi bigger than uh, 18 centimeters. 
that the round goal is with highest commercial values. Uh, normally, the price is 50 euro cent. In last year, even uh, it was some 70 euro cent. If it's fish is smaller, then it's go to fish meals. If it's uh, bigger, then uh, Latvians found the way how to transport back to origin country to Ukraine and. So fishermen are aiming and looking for bigger round gobies, and uh, what we see on our biological analysis is that uh, those bigger round gobies are mainly males, and also most of uh, landings consist from males. They are more active before spawning, and they could be more easily caught by passive fishing gears. Next few slides, I will try to present uh, some of our case studies, what we did in uh, National Project Evident. We work together with our colleagues from Hydroecology Institute. Where are you? Yuris. Uh, we had a case study area. It's a Jurmalciems close to the Lithuanian border. Uh, as you remember from previous slide, it's a hot spot uh, of commercial landings. Uh, what we did, we using underwater recording assessed uh, habitat. We collect data from zoobentos. We assess uh, round gobi biomass in coastal waters, and we perform also some feeding analysis for round gobi. We build a really simple. Uh, web model, what the main actor was Ron Gobi, what's the impact of Ron Gobi on a coastal ecosystem. And actually what we found, uh, the main food items were bivalves, the mollusks, of course the Mytilus edilus is the most important in all size groups and in all depth zones in our coastal waters. And the main conclusion from our study was in areas where we had the highest abundance of front gobies, it was uh, from 5 to 15 meters depth, we had already the lowest concentration of uh, metals edils. And we know before it was a really nice seabeds with, uh, covered by metals edils. And uh, round gobies are aiming uh, for mid-size and small-size metals. And in this picture, oops, not so. We will try to illustrate what's the difference between North Sea and Baltic Sea metals. Uh, in Baltic Sea, the smallest are much more smaller. They are uh, more easily available as uh, prey items, and so round gobi could easily eat out all of these mollusks. And thank you, Yuris, for really nice pictures to illustrate the uh, difference uh, what was the situation before. Uh, invasive, uh, in invasion of Ron Gobi. And uh, if you look a little bit more carefully, you could see some Ron Gobis. And uh, this picture, and you see there is only big individuals of uh, blue muscle left. So the main conclusion. We have something positive, something negative. We could see a really strong pressure of mus muscles. We already found, and it was presented also in some publication in uh, Bonus Inspire project, that there is feeding overlap with juvenile of Flounder and Turbot. Uh, but uh, there also is some positive thing. For example, we know in Baltic Sea we have skinny cod, but those cod who are living close to coast, they are feed mainly on round gobi and feeding condi and body condition of those cod are really good. And uh, as you remember from previous slides, it's uh, 
target species for fishermen and for sure it's the second most important fish species in coastal waters in Latvia for fishermen and in some areas it's by far the most important fish species, commercial fish species. And why we, we believe that we are a little bit special in Latvia, we have, we, together with uh, manager, managers, introduce some special uh, fishery management actions that we aim to reduce of uh, amount and impact of round gobi in our coastal waters. Uh, together with fishermen, we develop two special fishing gears. We develop special, special uh, fishing times from April till end of June. Uh, it's specially also distributed by municipalities. And nowadays fishermen uh, additionally with normal fishing gears could use special round gobi nets with a mesh size 60, 70. And uh, there are also special round gobi trap nets and as a result, uh, till, till uh, 2018, we had a sharp increase of round gobi landings. As I said, it was distributed by municipalities. We use a precautionary approach. Maybe we could even allow to fish on higher fishing mortality, but uh, we use this precautionary approach. Our main idea was to find the way how they could catch more round gobies and protect native species. As a result, we in uh, our scientific results, we see that there is decrease on round gobi in our coastal waters. Uh, the amount of other native fish species is stable, even some increase in later years. And if we look on proportions, we also could see some quite strict decrease in thrown gobies. From biological point of view, we should be happy because our aim when we introduced these management actions was to reduce amount of round gobi. Normally, we want to protect some fish species uh, to be, that those fish species will be available also for next generation. There, the aim was, I would say, opposite. We want to decrease amount of round gobi to protect native species. And uh, we have some nice trend, decreasing trend of round gobi. We are happy. Probably fishermen are not so happy because already they used to catch a lot of round gobi. It's a really good income for them. And so what's this, what could be situation for next year? And uh, then I ask to Ivars, what's the future of round gobi in next 100 years? And do we have a chance that it will be to become the most important and maybe we could fish out all round gobies and uh, this is example from Gulf of Riga and actually even in many different uh, scenarios there is uh, highly likely that uh, round gobi will be uh, as a part of our coastal ecosystem. Thank you. That was quick. Uh, questions? A lot of questions? Oh. I can really count on you. <laughs> it's, uh, probably it's again, maybe will be a question from fishermen, like Norman said, it's <laughs> not, but, but usually we are working close together, and especially now fishermen, and always the questions is asked. What you show, uh, at your simulation show that there is some quite stable, some increase. What is last year's experience from open sea coast? It is decrease, increase in Gulf of Riga. Mm -hmm. What is your uh, ideas? What could be this year? How it will, will be decrease in 
in uh, abundance of because his uh, uh, <coughs> muscles has gone and 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 what what is the uh, projections uh, your or your ideas how it will be in Gulf of Riga, whereas we last year still observed some increase? Thank you. Of course, if you look on commercial data, it's decreased just by one year. It's not trend. If you look in our surveys data, we could or observe already this trend some three, four years. Data showing from open part of the sea. So actually, we because in commercial fishery, what we did, we increase uh, fishing effort. That could be result why it decreased later than in our uh, survey results. What we see in uh, Gulf of Riga, it's different system from uh, open part. Probably there could be more predators, maybe some perch is involved, and uh, there is some time lag between open part and Gulf of Riga. And uh, it could be just speculations and uh, according to some theories, of course, in the beginning is some increase, then it's some stability and it should be some, to reach some level. But when it happened in Gulf of Riga, we should wait a few years and see. Robertus. He was first. <laughs> Okay, I do it very briefly. This is already responded part of my uh, maybe explanatory question or explanation that that we, we should uh, we should consider that the drowned gobby is still a totally new species in the system. It it needs some evolutionary micro evolutionary time to settle. But just wanted to mention that there are actually two processes going on at the Baltic sea level. One is still colonization of new areas, essentially. Uh, what we are showing in the, one of the first maps, the uh, Botnian Bay and Botnian Sea are relatively empty yet. The habitat is there, temperature is a bit limiting, but, but colonization of new areas and then stabilization on the already colonized areas. Uh, first uh, uh, bloom of round cobby, then reduction of the prey and then decrease of the predator basically following the Lotka Volterra equation. So we will see what happens, but still colonization of new areas is an ongoing process. Yeah, thank you for comment. And as I know also in Estonia, in some areas you have the similar signals that it was huge increase and already start to decrease. Uh, well, my question would be regarding this new gear that you introduced. Of course, Lithuanian fishermen take over well, they are very good relationship, at least the, the ones who are close towards the Latvian border and they, with Latvian fishermen, and they know that there is introduced uh, those uh, gill nets of 30, I suppose, millimeter mesh size. 60 to 70. Yeah, so yeah. 30, yeah. 30. It depends on where yeah. we, you know, yeah. where how, we to measure. how to measure. Uh, I just have a few questions regarding bycatch. Well, it's a, I should. Well, I would expect that there is a lot of small flounder as a bycatch. Is it the case, or not really? Uh, not really. Actually, in the springtime, quite often they have round gobi amount close to 90 percent. We had some special study because fishermen asked, "Is it possible to use the same gill nets in autumn time? Because after uh, spawning time, there again is some migration." And there is possibility to catch some round gobi. And what we found in autumn, it was really high amount of uh, bycatch. Different fish species, different uh, size groups. For example, if I remember, cod and wimba bream. And the worst thing that it was something 60, 70 below minimal landing size. So it really depends when and where. Okay, thank you, Didis. Give applause to Didis. And now we, now we move forward to Santa, who is going to give a speech about very tasty fish. Yeah, I'm happy to be here and tell about the stocking. Oh, where is the microphone? Yeah. Mm. Mm. 
I firstly, I want to point out that I am not the ichthyologist. I am microbiologist, but I am working in fisheries department now. And uh, I'm here for five years now. And uh, uh, first, I want to say that when I started to, to work in this laboratory, I started to hear uh, a, a lot about restocking. And uh, I heard a, a lot of doubts, a lot of criticism in the point of the restocking. And uh, I didn't hear no one, uh, no one positive uh, Op opinion on that, and uh, through the, during these years, I, I, I went through this this topic, and I wanted I started to search: is it really so bad? Is it really so? No, so mm, does everyone? Everyone whom I met, they they were brave to express some doubts on on the stocking, and so in this presentation, I want to show you from this story from the positive positive uh, view and i'm trying to give the value of this large restocking program what we are do, do, during, doing through the decades and to the stock what we still have in latvia in very good level in comparison with other, other countries what we have in our, our no in neighbor countries and firstly, I want to say that uh, restocking started already more than 100 years ago, and it was mm, discovered in France. And uh, it was uh, why it became so popular because it was discovered that fertilization of fish eggs is uh, much more effective when they are fertilized in dry bowl directly with uh, with milk and they are mixed and only then is the water added and in comparison with natural spawning this outcome is much more effective and in that same time it was researched that only one percent of uh, salmon eggs is fertilized, fertilized, fertilized in nature naturally and uh, fertilization in hatcheries is much more effective at this in, in nature and and uh, in Latvia, in the territory in Lat Latvia, firstly, uh, Salmon restocking did Alvin Skirsch. Uh, he, he worked in, on Gauja river base in Gauja. He developed this, his first hatchery in Tarnikova. Uh, during First World War, this hatch no, he stopped. Uh, yeah, and he released, uh, firstly, fry. Those were only fries, and he released in in Salatsa, in Lielupe, in Gauja, in Daugava, and he even exported to Netherlands and to France. In that times, without oxygen supply, artificial. And uh, yes, during First World War, this uh, stocking was was stopped, and after war, it was renovated again. And it concentrated in Tuome, Karli, and Pelci. And we yeah, are releasing about three million of, of salmon larvae yearly, yearly. And yes, but as uh, it, it was perspective to, to dam Daugava and to build these hydropower stations, then this uh, rearing was intensively de developed and uh, yes and that that was in latvia time and then in soviet uh, time as well uh, this was planned for these three hydro hydroelectro power station building and daugo will be completely dam and we had we had to to conserve our salmon stock and it was uh, how it, this history, history goes that at the beginning those were larvae which were released then uh, intensively well de were de developed technologies to, to release uh, juveniles and then smolts and all this time our colleagues in, in previous century they worked very hard to develop it and to keep the stock and uh, 
I am really proud to say that for since 1975, we already 45 years we have our dog of salmon in Latvia. And uh, I do not know another country who has real stock what, she, what was maintained since so long time. And uh, I want to say that we, in this time, we developed this restocking, uh, this rearing in very good flow trout systems. And those countries who, star who started to use recirculation systems, they slowly lost their stocks, but we still have, we have very good hatcheries working on flow trout system, and we still have our stock. Uh, and right now we are working on this national, we, we have plants, uh, national fish resource restocking plan. Uh, it goes through through years. When we finish one, then we have another one, next one, which is improved, and we follow this restocking continuously. Uh, yes, and we have this restocking, and, and from, I was looking how it is in, in, in nature, in natural population, how it is in Baltic how it looks in another countries, and how many natural salmon gives our neighbors. And uh, these are results from 2018. In another years, this picture is different. And I see that the majority is not natural salmon gives our neighbor, Finland and Sweden. And we, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Russia, we give really small, small part of natural salmon. And I was very surprised when I saw that Germany gives nothing, Denmark, give, Denmark gives nothing, as well as Poland, where we introduce our dog of salmon. Poland has very weak, absolutely weak natural stock, which gives nearly nothing. And Yes, uh, about sea trout, then the main country that gives sea trout to Baltic Sea, it is Denmark and Sweden. Uh, yes, and in this map you see natural, natural salmon rivers. And if we look at this map, then we see that seven of them are located in Latvia. The majority is in Sweden, and the main st uh, natural Salmon gives this river that go, uh, is border river between Finland and Sweden. And uh, looking at this map, I see that we, Latvia, we are keeping this stock from our side, and from another other side of sea, this stock is kept by Finland and Sweden. And yes, if about natural stock in Latvia, then from this picture we see that the best production is in Salatsa and in Gauja, Amat and Venta. The stocks, natural stocks are very weak. Uh, yeah, we have eutrophication problems and hydropower plants and small and larger, larger different, and as well as climate change that influence this natural stock very much. And if we put together natural Salmon and our rear salmon. Then we see this picture, and this is a picture for whole Baltic Sea. How many how many salmons gives every country? And I am again. I was surprised that I see that Denmark and Germany gives nothing, not reared, not natural, but Latvia. Latvian our share is very large, and from this we have ten percent. Uh, this natural with reared and. With this picture, I want to show that we have we have very valuable stock what we brought through centuries, and that is a stock with what we can count on what and what we can use and to research and no, looks great. Uh, yes, and the next is the best one because uh, since five five years we, we are cutting 
thing clipping, thing clipping in marking our salmons and sea trout that we released from our hatcheries in the Baltic Sea. And we see that from this table that Venta gives seven, no, those salmons which goes back from from sea for spawn in Venta, those are 70, 72 persons which are from hatchery region. In Daugava, they are nearly 100 persons. And in Gauja, 69. Uh, these persons vary with years. In last year, it was a li little bit different. But anyway, the largest portion what goes back to rivers for spawn is hatchery region. And yes, and then we had some had in interesting, in interesting studies, and we tested on that was Ilza Rutkowska together with Ruta, and they tested systems recirculation and flow trough system, and they not discovered, but uh, ver verified that those sea trout that are reared in flow trout systems are much more adapted to sea water, and they, after, no, they smoltify no, normally. But those which are kept in recirculation, they, they are not adapted to sea water very good. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So, nat nat natural spawning potential nowadays is very weak in, in, in rivers of whole Baltic. Uh, and uh, from Latvia, I know that in other countries there are a lot of problems and they are uh, doubting the rearing system. But in Latvia, we uh, have discontinuous rearing in flow trout systems and I have impression that because of that we have this more or less stable salmon stock, and and I have feeling that without artificial re rep reproduction, if something happens, with the, if if there are some some changes, we have potential to lose our stock, and maybe not we, but our neighbors as well, and. Uh, Yes, because of this stock, we have, we can use it, we can fish, we can use long lines, we can trolling use, we can licence angling, we are, we can use this. And of course we have a lot of problems and a lot of prob uh, challenges in this, this, this field, but the main Challenge for us, uh, I see that it is maintain our salmon stock as it is, or maybe improve even. That would, would, would be the best. And of course, to maintain natural, no, natural well, well salmons and restore habitats, re, no, maintain genetic diversity, seals of course, and, and genetic behavior, yeah, diversity in stock. And uh, yes, and it would be very great if we would improve our reporting system on catched salmon, as I know and feel that they are catched much more as they are reported, as we report on our catches, and we can say that other countries can use it less. And many others, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Santa. Do we have any question? Uh, as we know, in Gawi River, this year just started licensed fishery and it's uh, mainly based on hatchery salmon. What's your idea as how it will impact uh, of Gawi River uh, salmon population? Because so far we, it was not very legal fishery, Starting from 1st of January, there is possibility to catch them legally. I do not have the opinion now. <laughs> Maybe I will have later. I don't know. I, uh, yeah. But, uh, but they already spawned and these eggs are led and, and maybe it is not so 
so bad as they are fished out. And no, yeah, but we will see it later. Maris? Uh, Short, uh, short question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you mentioned that it's uh, uh, some stock not be able to maintain without artificial reproduction. In the same time, what I understood from one slide in the beginning, state program where total small production is going, for salmon is going down. What is for going down? It decreasing by what? years. Small production. That is natural. Uh, natural. But in these rivers. millions, what is released? What, uh, can you go back? It's somewhere in the beginning, huh? with Daugava River, maybe I misunderstood something wrong. Which one? Yeah, this here. Uh, yeah, this is, you it, see, it, salmon smolts are going decreasing, that is a and the uh, sea trout is increasing, and how it is, why it is? Oh, uh, uh, this program is changing all the time. Yeah, I cannot, in fact, this. I would like to have salmon more as sea trouts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, probably I could answer because uh, we are ordering uh, the restocking for Institute, and uh, there is a consideration uh, that uh, for salmon there is uh, many different limitations. Uh, and rules uh, applicable uh, for European Union and for a Baltic Sea, uh, but for sea trout, it's a more local, local use uh, stocks, and therefore we are turn a little bit uh, uh, this proportion, and we are uh, looking forward uh, to restock more uh, sea trout, and uh, then responsibly from uh, our side, we are we could use this stock uh, compared to the salmon. Uh, which are managed by the European Union. There is development of salmon action plan and so on and so on. The sea trout is more uh, free for, for a member state uh, uh, management and this is why we are trying to turn to the sea trout uh, reproduction. But uh, also then there is a question if there is a capacity uh, to increase uh, the sea trout uh, reproduction in, in the uh, bee or fish farms uh, because there is an interest already now for a Gauja river and then there are some um, uh, tributaries of the Gauja river to restock uh, the uh, sea trout. Is there is a possibility to increase the sea trout uh, reproduction? That is a question. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Thank you, Norman, for comments. Thank you, mm -hmm. Santa. Mm -hmm. Give please applause. Our next speaker is Nerius from Lithuania. Uh, we always could ask uh, what's better to release a lot of juveniles and smalls or maybe we should uh, restore habitats. What's your opinion? So hello again, uh, like my colleague Robertas, I, I also came from Klaipeda University and uh, I was asked, uh, thank you for the invitation, and I was asked uh, maybe to present uh, another one project which are, uh, we are running among, along with uh, along other partners, also with the BIOR. So it's a retrout project which uh, deal, about, uh, deal sustainable um, stock management. But uh, together with, this, with some project results, I want to present the general situation in Lithuania, how we see it. And uh, I plan to present uh, my institution, but uh, saving time, I just will say some words uh, for, for those who don't know what is the Klaivada University. So it's the only uh, region, uh, only university in uh, Western Lithuania region. And, uh, our competences mainly are within uh, in uh, maritime and marine uh, marine ecology, biology, and other environmental sciences. 
So uh, we are from Marine Research Institute and we have like five uh, infrastructure laboratories, including fleet. Uh, we have three vessels. And one of the newest laboratories is the fisheries and aquaculture laboratory, where we have uh, recirculating aquaculture systems, also uh, uh, experimental systems for ecological uh, experiments. Also, uh, we are uh, developing <coughs> salt water recirculating aquaculture for shrimp cultivation. But uh, uh, in general, uh, this aquaculture is quite new uh, topic uh, in, in university, but uh, since uh, 1998 or even uh, before, we we working on fish biology, fish ecology, also stock assessment, and this is our background, and this was my my start of my career, so I would like to speak about this. So in Lithuania, Salmonid River and Stock uh, Management uh, started officially in 1998 when the program was approved and uh, started, and main parts of this program or, or main activities are uh, fisheries regulation, commercial fish, I mean, this is commercial fishery regulation, also monitoring, then fish pass construction and stocking. So uh, I heard a lot of good examples from Latvian, uh, Latvian stocking program. We have a bit different uh, experience and I would like to shortly present it. Uh, so in the uh, news, in the media, you can find very often uh, like, you know, papers about uh, saying that without stocking, the anglers would not have what to fish, or that uh, fish were released, and the, the, the title of paper says that the population were successfully restored or something. But the fact is that uh, uh, there is rarely research is done to evaluate real uh, success of, of the stocking. And uh, yes, we have good examples. One is uh, a Salmon, uh, salmon case, uh, uh, two decades ago, we had only Jaymen uh, uh, population uh, left uh, natural, naturally reproducing, but uh, stocking was started, the or original uh, stocking material were, were from this, was from this population, and then uh, populations were established in all the Neris, uh, uh, basin, then later also in Dubis, in smaller Dubisa catchment, in uh, Shventoi catchment, and now we already have uh, self-reproducing population in Mini uh, catchment. So this is a good example, uh, and uh, and populations are strong enough. Uh, the the other uh, example would be eel, like. Uh, uh, we had the long history of uh, inland water restocking with the, with the glass seal, and you can see that uh, uh, when, uh, when the stocking almost ceased after the regaining of the, of the independence, uh, landings uh, of eel in inland waters already started to decrease. Uh, so this is one of the, not one, but the, the most uh, valuable fish species in Lithuania uh, by price. So it completely depends uh, on, on stocking, uh, how to say, activities. But we have also some not so good or not so positive examples. And uh, I would like to show you Eura catchment uh, Example, so this is one of the biggest uh, sea trout reproductive areas in Lithuania, uh, but the, the thing is that uh, you can see the red, red line uh, looking into average basin um, uh, density pop of population. You can see that uh, it fluctuates in all the catchments, but uh, in Eura River it remains uh, in the poorest condition. So. Uh, Looking into trend lines, you can see that there is a, a completely flat line in, in almost 20 year period. And if we are looking into stocking uh, intensity, it, it's constantly increasing. Uh, it's a released amount of juveniles. I didn't mention, but our stocking program basically uh, is 
uh, basically is uh, based on juvenile stalking, not older uh, individuals. So the releases of, uh, of juveniles increasing, but situation doesn't change. So, so for stalking uh, don't, uh, didn't, uh, improve, didn't improve situation. And uh, what could be the, the reasons for that? One of this could be population genetics. So all you know that uh, sea trout is a migratory species having homing effect. And uh, my colleague Aurelia Samuilovien, uh, who defended uh, a PhD on uh, salmonid genetic, on, on salmonid population genetic structure, she found that uh, all the popula of sea trout populations in Lithuania are very well structured. Uh, if we are taking uh, like uh, big catchments, uh, like here uh, Nemanas, uh, uh, taking Bartuva or Akmenodanya catchments, like those three, the, there are statistically genetical, uh, statistically uh, significant genetical difference between those uh, main Baltic Sea tributaries. But if we are going deeper into like Nemonas catchment, we also can see that there is statistically uh, significant genetical difference between main tributaries of Nemonas River, like Mini, Eura, and so on. If we are going deeper into one catchment, so we see that even between like here, small small streams like Blenjev and Mishupis, which geographically have only two kilometer difference uh, uh, where they confluent the main uh, Minia channel, there also are genetically statistical statistical difference. So mixing population is not is not good practice uh, to do, but in Latin actually this is how our stocking program is based. So we are taking one stock and then they are breed and then distributed all, all over the Lithuanian water bodies. So I, as I understand in Latvia, you have different situation. You, you keep genetic origin uh, within the same territory and don't mix, don't mix the stocks and what that is good. Also Aurelia found that uh, taking the, this uh, genetical difference, it, it's increasing with the, with the geographical distance. The other problem could be uh, pr problems with stocking material. I didn't hear about that in Santa's presentation, but I can uh, honestly say that we have these problems and uh, not sometimes, but basically always uh, stocking material are not in the best uh, condition. So they have uh, defects of fins, operculum deformations. Also, when, when they are catched already in, in stream, they have some growth disorders. Uh, also, you know that there is behavior problems be because they are used to, to fee artificial feeding. They don't have uh, this natural instinct to, to, uh, of, of predation risk and so on. That's why this could be one of the reasons why it's not, not so successful. And also there is a problem with the competition with natural uh, population. We all always see difference, size difference between natural and artificially stocked uh, individuals. And we did some uh, studies, so experiments were done, so, it, so they were kept in uh, artificially in cages uh, through the winter and it was found that the, the survival was very low also, you can see here general survival that uh, almost none of the stocked fish survive till the till the autumn or uh, even to or at least to 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 next year. So the the stocking efficiency is really low, and uh, that's why we want to reconsider our so our stock management strategy. It could be like. Uh, to change uh, uh, stocking program structure, like uh, to follow uh, genetic origin and to release fish in, it, in its native basin. Uh, other things could be uh, like uh, more long-termly sustainable and it's, uh, it would be river restoration. Uh, just very shortly, probably all of you, of you know what is river restoration. It could be like uh, habitat creation, it could be bank, uh, bank uh, enforcement, it could be remandering of river uh, and so on. And there is many manuals with, uh, with 
technical designs how to do this uh, in the best way. Uh, here you can see several examples uh, how rivers could be dramatically changed from big channel into meandering uh, smaller river and so on. Also habitat restorations like formation of spawning grounds and uh, in Lithuania, we don't have such uh, much of such experience. Actually, we can count on one uh, hand the fingers all the restoration projects. One of, of these were uh, river remandering in 1992, and the other is quite new project by Environmental Protection Agency. It's uh, 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 rehabilitation of river. They they put some stones, logs, and so on. Uh, helping river to reestablish their manders and so on. So it was, it is strategy chosen by Lithuania because it was estimated re remandering this heavy restoration is very expensive. It is billions of, it, it, it was litas, but it's still, it's very expensive in euros. So it was decided to leave uh, uh, channelized streams for self uh, self-rehabilitation, so we expect that in 50 or 100 years they will, they will back in their natural shape, just with some slight help like, uh, like here. But we have uh, more experience in other, in, in uh, fish pass uh, construction, we have in, twen in 20 years we, we built uh, about 25 uh, fish pass, some of them are uh, success, uh, successful, some not. Here's the newest, uh, newest fish pass built on small stream, but as you know, now Western countries uh, tend to remove dams but not build uh, fish passes, actually. And uh, I, I, I want to uh, proudly say that in Lithuania, we will, ha we will have first dam removal project, uh, which will be uh, in in next few years. Uh, it's Salantas River Dam, which will be completely removed, and uh, the channel will be restored. Uh, the task is, or the reason for this is just to restore salmon and, uh, and lamprey migration channel. And uh, uh, shortly about the retrout project uh, activities, uh, what, we, what we did there. So uh, this project deals with the uh, with, um, uh, fishing tourism based on sea trout stocks. So, and as all we can understand, but that without good stocks, we cannot uh, develop this uh, tourism. So, so also project uh, try to find best uh, long-term solutions how to, to secure good stock status. And we did uh, recultivation in small streams Militale, just beside Klaipeda. It was a pond uh, restored and habitat created. And uh, yes, yeah, Militale is quite productive. Uh, the, uh, it don't have much uh, good habitats, but it's where they are good habitats, it's quite productive. So we restored the uh, biopond systems in 1996. There it, uh, Channelized uh, channel was uh, remandered, and it was like this without nothing. And then it was uh, such uh, meandering uh, pond system built. Uh, it was not maintained for 20 years, so so we did uh, uh, some maintenance for that. Removed sediments from sedimentation pots. Uh, it was about three, three and a half thousand of cubic meters muddy sediments removed. And uh, this is how it looked before and after. Yeah, so. And the last activity, uh, spawning habitats were created in, in the stream. Uh, we didn't change the uh, channel itself. We just added the material in it uh, and uh, uh, the base for that was my PhD uh, and my experience in, in uh, spawning, sea trout spawning habitats. It was based on the uh, pool riffle on that structure. So sea trout and lamprey basically spawn on that site. Uh, as uh, I found in my, in my studies, basically they choose a pool riffle transition and they avoid the pool sections. 
and uh, what is uh, specific pools for uh, pool refill transition it's a, a downwelling situation it means that ground uh, up, uh, up um, surface water downwell into into substrate and ventilate eggs so we created uh, three sections of that type habitat so here you can see how it looked before and after three sections uh, before it was muddy sand, after that it became nice, nice uh, riffles. And a uh, few last photos about the result. So this autumn we expected to have at least some activities, but actually we, we had really nice spawning of sea trout. And here you can see one of the restored section and, and big sea trout thread. Uh, here you can see spawning fish. Sometimes we could uh, uh, see like three fishes there or like even four or five fishes on, on a nest, uh, constructing nest. And in total, there were 30 nests constructed. Uh, in, in our sites, we found the biggest uh, in the whole stream nests constructed and the spawning itself was very long, uh, one and a half months. And we plan to... Uh, to monitor the efficiency of uh, of uh, of these habitats, and then we will have more clear answer how effective, in fact, they were. So, thank you. Thank you, Nerius. Do we have any questions, Marcis? A uh, very short question. What kind of aquaculture systems you use for uh, sea trout and salmon fingerling uh, farming? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, rust yeah. system or yeah, slow Yeah, basically, through? it is based on rust system. We, uh. we don't have a flow-through system uh, as a complete. As such, sometimes the water is taken from river, but it still then have this res uh, recirculatory then system so basically all the all the system use groundwater or surface water but but water is uh, recirculated and treated in a, in a system uh, and there is only in, sorry and there is only one uh, hatcher in Lithuania state owned because it's it's only state business to to hatch to 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 breed the uh, salmon and other valuable fish species so there is only one one hatchery uh, maybe this is the answer of a bad uh, are stockings? Uh, yeah. You mean recirculating water, water condition, or that only one? Fa that because of choice of method. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Nerius. Do we have any? Maybe I have some short question. What's the situation with beavers in Lithuania? Because I just uh, I have here. Like because in Latvia, about 40 slides, so I just removed before the last one I had about the beavers, but I thought it's already too much. So it's a constant problem in Lithuania, and we consider one of the uh, as one of the main also problems uh, uh, which affect uh, salmonid populations. So when we build these new habitats, we had the <laughs> beaver dam, which we, we had to fight constantly just not to to lose this very new uh, sections established. So yeah, this is a problem. And one more last question from Normans. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, it's uh, quite a good experience what you show here. Uh, have you uh, problems uh, with uh, landowners, if you are changing the river, you are making meanders, then uh, there is a question how you settle uh, these mm -hmm. issues. Thank you. Yes, within the City Trout Project, uh, we are working with uh, more examples uh, all in, in all Baltic countries, and uh, this is like a general, how to say, tendency that most of restoration projects failed due to uh, problems with stakeholders that you cannot agree on on some specific uh, uh, 
things. So in this case, we didn't have any problem with this. It's a private land, but uh, they just, the, the thing was that we had to move through his land uh, transporting the material to the river. But the river itself, it's a state-owned. All, all rivers are state-owned, so we just were doing activities in a river channel, so we had no problem. Yeah, but we didn't, uh, we didn't, uh, did the earthworks, so it was only, only gravel stones and, uh, and logs put into existing channel, not changing its shape. Yeah, but this could, this would be one of the main problems to, to agree with the landowner to, if you want to succeed. Thank you, Nerius. We had a nice discussion on, about different type of dams, how to remove them. In Latvia also, we have different type of dams. One of them is uh, hydro power station dams and how it's influencing fishes. Maybe Kaspers could explain. Just a minute. So first of all, I would like to admit that I'm glad to be part of this institute for all 10 years of its, its, since its foundation. And I'm here to present uh, results what we, gave, what we get when we had a closer look on the uh, impact of power stations on uh, fishes and trying to estimate um, how we could reduce it. Uh, when I'm saying we, I mean uh, the bag, we, we did it within the project, which was a uh, in, Latlit Interreg project, uh, and backbone of all of this was, uh, sorry, I don't know your English name. Uh, Jesus. So, those two guys. And uh, it was done together with uh, Lithuanian Institute of Energetics and they involved uh, guys from Vilnius Nature Research Center, Thomas Virbitskis and Vitatas Kesminas. Uh, but uh, since I myself, my scientific background is a river lamprey and my scientific interest is the river lamprey, I would start with a river lamprey. Uh, within the Lamprey project, uh, I bumped into, we were trying to establish what, what we want to achieve within this project, what will be the target of the project results later on. And I bumped into that uh, graph and it somehow reminded me something that I have seen somewhere. And uh, you will, I suppose you will like to ask me, uh, what, what does it have to do with uh, uh, with uh, power stations, and the answer is like this. Actually, I have seen that line, but in a bit different way, and I think it could be linked. Uh, however, at least they go along together perfectly in a time scale. When the power stations were built, the lamprey went down, and uh, if we know that the average life cycle of the average lamprey is some six to seven years, and if we count forward from the reaching the peak of a number of power stations in the same region, the lamprey is, is went down and never recovered from it. So our hypothesis is that it might be linked, and how it could be linked, uh, one, of course, is the obvious decision since lampreys is an uh, anadromous species who need to migrate to spawning grounds in the uh, freshwater. Uh, one of obvious answers is that uh, power stations is blocking migration route, but it's not only the case because power stations change the water flow below it. And the impact actually quite huge part of the river, up to maybe 20 kilometers, even more. And, uh, that is what we were having uh, 
I will look on. And uh, Nerius was showing uh, spawning red of uh, seeds route. Um, here we can see the spawning red as well. But uh, in that case, that red is uh, the, the grimmest part of it, that red is dry. And it is below the power station. So it's clear power station impact. And uh, that's why we are talking about uh, ecological flows, which we, which we need to establish under the power station. And I will read the definition of it. Like ecological flow is the quality, quantity, and timing of water flows required to maintain the component, components, functions, processes, and resilience of aquatic ecosystems. And I would like to point that it is a quality, quantity, and timing uh, in a so overall concept of, of e flow because in Latvia we see it as a one figure. And that figure since 2006 should be put on a water permit, water use permit for power stations. And uh, uh, theoretically, that figure, that one figure, which is not the uh, timing quantity and so on, it's just one figure, it, it should come from two sources. One source is fisheries expertise paper, paper which is uh, written by Institute Bio, and uh, another paper, which is written from env environmental specialist who is not uh, defined. Who, who is here? I suppose it's a uh, uh, guy from a list uh, which from a nature protection board. And uh, so far, if we was asked, uh, then we calculated the average flow uh, in uh, July and August, the long term, and uh, divided it by half and said, okay, that's the ecological flow. And uh, why I'm saying when we were asked, and if we were asked, because in most cases we even weren't, uh, there is such a term as sanitary flow, which is, uh, I'm not sure about if, if I'm able to, to translate it correctly, but it's very minimal flow which should be granted for river not to dry out. And it was, somehow, for some reason, just uh, later put in a water usage permits and said that it's now ecological flow. But it was still the, the very minor, the miserable nothing uh, of sanitary flow. And uh, uh, more closely to, the, to our job, uh, what we did, we applied not like calculation of average of two months flow and dividing into it too. We uh, used a meso habitat simulation model, meso -hapsim, which as far as I know, I'm not a specialist in the, in the modeling of habitats, but uh, as far as I know, it was derived from some other models looking more on, a, on a micro habitats somewhere in the change of centuries. And the idea is that, that fish dwell in a bigger habitat as a invertebrates, and it's pointless to try to push the rather big pike or, or, or seeds out somewhere in a microhabitat because it, it's very hardly to quantify later its movements because it's the, the impact of chance is too big, and it's, that's why the fish were put in a bigger environment. And uh, to, to do it, we need a lot of data. Of course, we need one of the things we need to detailed information on discharge, but uh, we, of course, need a very big amount and very detailed data on a, on a river is, as such. It was done by the help of SimStream software, which is GIS, uh, put together with GIS, and, and uh, it sort of helps uh, someone to communicate with a computer and not, not to make any human-like mistakes. And of course, we needed the fish data to put it all together in the meso model. Uh, that's how, how, it, uh, how it happens, uh, how it is done for the collection of uh, river data. Uh, we did it all in six power stations, uh, three in Vente River Basin District, three in uh, Lielupe River Basin District, but uh, I will go a bit more in details for uh, Cietzere River and Pakuli uh, power station. In uh, Cietzere River, it was done in two sites with a length of 700 meters. 
with a total area of almost one hectare. And uh, in one of those two sites, there was 44 point measurement, uh, 40 point hydromorphological units, uh, mesohabitats, and uh, altogether it was 310 measurements. So it's rather a big workload. And uh, what we did is fish data. Uh, first, we produced a, a list of species of interest, just not to be looking somewhere, uh, to modeling something which is not native for the, for the basin. Then we uh, produced a conditional model. It's the way how to, you, we can see the examples of conditional models down there. It's the way how to tell the computer how the fish act and which way of, uh, which kind of uh, mesohabitat will the fish choose. And uh, of course, then we did the uh, electrofishing and it allowed us to narrow the list of fish species specific for each river because we do not really have an interest uh, to model the behavior or the avail availability of biotopes of fish species which not, not be, will not be dwelling in the river. So, what is going out of it? It's such a curves. Uh, we can see the mesohabitat simulation model, it calculates habitat availability curves for different uh, fish species. Uh, I would like to ask you to, <laughs> to, to pay attention on the listing. It's the upper we go, the more adults we find, and the, the lower we go, there is more uh, more uh, juveniles uh, or just smaller species. It's because the more water you have, <coughs> the, the bigger fish can live there. And uh, that's why partly the idea of one figure uh, of, uh, of ecological flow is not okay Be uh, because we need to uh, to ensure reproduction and then living of small fishes, and then we need to pro provide opportunity for migrating species and for overwintering species, which is large. And that's why most probably we'll have two figures, but let's move forward. And later, the results that, that we go, what we get from that curve can be incorporated in different another, another analysis. You can have, put a time series, at what time the analyst, uh, the situation is below some expected or needed value and so on. And what else we can do, we can produce a traffic light maps, which, which really does not help you to, to estimate the ecological flow, but which is very good and useful for a discussion with stakeholders, because if you show the red line and saying, you see, you see, the trout cannot dwell there, it's much more uh, trustworthy from uh, stakeholders say it as to show some strange curves and saying there's somewhere, the answer is somewhere in the middle there. So, and uh, the time is running out, so to, to the results. Uh, I will just run through all the three, po uh, six power stations. So our suggestions, why suggestions? Because uh, as I mentioned, the uh, ecological flow should come from two specified papers which should be asked from a ministry or from a state inspectorate, and it's just a suggestion. Uh, but we can see in a Pakuli power station, where I showed the picture of the dry red, uh, the wintering or the spawning or the adult uh, ecological flow is very higher, almost uh, 10 times higher as a uh, that one which is, which is in the permit now, and also for the juveniles, flow should be higher. And it's difference in uh, adult power station is uh, a bit smaller, but still. And we can, uh, we can say it about almost all power stations, where we can look with one exception, with <laughs> just one exception, then a power station, now it's a river. Uh, Today's ecological flow, which is calculated, cal which is not the senator flow just taken over, which is calculated, as I mentioned, average, half of average of July, August, is okay for uh, juveniles. So we have at least one good result. 
And uh, this is my last slide, but uh, I would like to just point out some differences between the project and the real life, which, which was really easy and okay in the project. is now burdening us a bit more. Uh, first of all, there was two institutions involved, which is easy in a project. You're united by project you have, but now you need to find a way how to cooperate without a project for two independent institutions. Other problem is that uh, we have 142 small power stations and we just cannot go to all. Uh, of course we can, but it will take 20 years. And uh, we need to, because it's huge workload, you cannot do it in one minute. And uh, we need to prepare a list of, of something uh, with, with whom to start or, or what to do. So we are looking actually very much in the future of how we will implement those results. We know how to calculate that uh, ecological flow, but uh, it will be interesting how it will be working in reality. Thank you. Thank you, Kasp Thank you Kaspars. Any question before coffee break? We still have time for a few questions. Robertas. Just a short question, as you brought up Lampreys uh, in Kurijeme. Uh, there's studies been done in Lithuania and Lowland Rivers and published, uh, I think it's by Nerius maybe, may, may I order that, uh, uh, spawning grounds of lam river lamprey and sea trout greatly overlap, well, very greatly. Uh, and do you see uh, the same tendencies in sea trout population? I mean, naturally recruited in in Kurijeme as well, or some changes in uh, capacity, filling of uh, river capacity downstream, or something like that? Uh, not really. It is a sh <laughs> the short answer, but the short mm -hmm. question is not really, but a bit longer. The answer is, uh, it's not just a spawning place, it's also the biology. If for the sea trout park, it's more or less, it doesn't matter if it's 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, the average depth in a play, or 0 0.15 even, or 0 0.3. But uh, for the lamprey amoset who lives next to the river bank, it's dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, and he either moves out or either dies, that's our hypothesis. It's a very short technical question. What species is uh, Spirlin? Oh, it's a Latin, can you say Latin name because... <laughs> the short answer, you should call Thomas Verbitskis because it was his idea that this species should be called like that. It's Albanoides bipunctatus. I can't see any questions and we have a last possibility to go to have a lunch, to go have a lunch. But before lunch, we have possibility to see our nice posters. And so, officially, lunch break. Thirty minutes. I think thirty minutes. Twenty. And coffee break. And please be back right in time.
Shall we start the final session of this very, very nice uh, event? I hope you didn't miss me. I heard that you didn't. <laughs> that was not, I was not happy to hear that, but okay. So uh, let's continue, let's move forward. And now I would like to invite Zinters to give his speech on something about water quality. <laughs> so uh, Zinters, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Chair, for a kind introduction. Sure. My name is Zinters, and I'm representing uh, Bior Institute, and today I will speak about the implementation of Water Framework Directive in Baltic Sea region countries. Yeah. Okay. That work? Okay. Something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, how often do we think about water importance? There are just some facts about water that water makes on average 70% of our body weight. It carries nutrients to all cells in our body and oxygen to our brain, allows, to, allows the body to absorb and assimilate minerals and other nutrients, flushes out toxins and waste, helps to regulate body temperature, and we can continue this list with these facts. But uh, the main conclusion about water is that water is a vital element of each of our lives. Uh, but water is not essential to our health only. It used also for a numerous of household tasks like a cooking, cleaning, and so on. And there are two main sources of water, uh, surface water and um, groundwater. Surface water could be found in lakes, rivers, and other water reservoirs. Uh, while uh, groundwater lies under the surface of, of the land where it is travels through and fills openings in the rocks. Uh, accor according to the, depending on the sources of water, it could be of different quality. And uh, you can see the list of the main water quality parameters like a concentration of dissolved oxygen, bacteria levels, uh, salinity, turbidity, macroscopic algae, quantities of pesticides, uh, heavy metals, and other uh, contaminants. Uh, according to recent findings, unsafe water sources are responsible for a number of, uh, for a mil more than one million deaths uh, each year. And here you can see the data from uh, the year 2017, and you can see that unsafe water uh, is response, unsa unsafe, the using of unsafe water sources uh, is responsible for uh, more than 1.2 million of deaths, uh, which is uh, comparable with uh, uh, poor physical activity and uh, secondhand uh, smoking. And um, in order to ensure acceptable quality of water, 20 years ago in the European Union, the Water Framework Directive, WFD, was implemented and um, was started to implement. And the main goals of these directives, uh, of this directive are protecting of all water bodies, including transitional waters and coastal waters, covering all impacts on waters, and achievement of good status of water. And the good status in terms of ecological status, chemical status, and the quantitative status. Uh, so the water quality is controlled in terms of biology, chemistry, and morphology. And this, in, the, in, in the frame of this directive, special attention was paid also to socioeconomic impacts. 
But during the implementation of water framework directive by competent authorities, competent authorities faced a lot of challenges and uh, issues. And uh, you can see the, some, some statistics uh, with the reports about implementation of WFD in the EU and uh, with regards to implementation in Baltic Sea region countries. Uh, for the period of 16 years, we have only 54 reports about the implementation of Water Framework Directive. And you can see the number of, number of reports by each country of the region of Baltic Sea. Here you can see the time scale of WFD implementation. It started in, two, uh, in year 2000, and the idea was to achieve the good quality of all water in the EU by the year 2015. But as I mentioned before, there were a lot of challenges and a lot of issues with the implementation of this water framework directive, and therefore, extensions to the, to the deadline was made, uh, extensions were made, and uh, two additional cycles were accepted. And now we are somewhere here in the year 2020, and uh, last year the review of implementation, there was a rep report reported by European Commission on the implementation of Water Framework Directive in the European countries. And uh, yeah, the report was reported by, by the Commission. And um, it, what about the Baltic region countries? In the Baltic region, implementation of Water Framework Directive uh, performed by eight European Union member states, including uh, Denmark, Poland, uh, Germany, Lithuania, Latvia, uh, Estonia, Finland, and Sweden, and uh, three non-EU countries, Belarus, Russia, and Norway. And as I mentioned before, last report was, was became available uh, last year, and it showed us that on, that few areas of research are well documented, while some areas are blind spots. And this, uh, this, um, this commission report summarizes the implementation of WFD by each member state. If we are speaking about Baltic region, so we have to address some points like a governance, characterization of river basin districts, monitoring and assessment of ecological status of surface water, monitoring and assessment of chemical status of surface water, monitoring and assessment of groundwater quantitative status, and monitoring and assessment of groundwater chemical status. So the governance, as we know, the appropriate Perform, uh, go, uh, appropriate governance of water quality management is an essential precondition uh, for achieving the WFD objectives. During the implementation of second cycle, many member states improved coordination among the responsible authorities and realized significant part of monitoring programs. For example, a lot of projects were performed in Latvia and Lithuania. International cooperation has been impro improved also during the second cycle, and the public consultation was significantly improved and resulted in the involvement of stakeholders and harmonization of river basin management plans. So, what about characterization of river basin districts? Uh, according to WFD Article 5 requires that member state, that each member state undertake an analysis of the characteristics of each river basin district 
is the area from which all surface water, uh, for, for all surface runoffs, flows into the sea through a single river mouth. In general, some, problem, uh, so, some progress has been made during the second cycle in the establishment of reference conditions within the European Union, but not for all water bodies. From Baltic region, only Poland have established all reference conditions for all water body types. Uh, majority Baltic region member states establish reference conditions only for some water categories. For example, Denmark, Finland and Latvia did not establish reference conditions for any water category. So it's our problem, I think. Uh, well, uh, for the second cycle, almost all river bus and districts have reported inventories for at least some priority substances. For example, in Latvia, all priority substances which were proposed for monitoring were accepted for official monitoring. While, for example, in Sweden, only less than 10 priority substances were accepted. Uh, what about ecological status? Each member state established a surveillance monitoring and, and operational monitoring programs. And uh, as results, according to the recent results, there are still insufficient number of <coughs> surveillance and operational monitoring uh, sites in some member states. And with regard to Baltic region, you can see the numbers, you can see the surveillance and operational sites per uh, 1,000 square kilometers. And uh, there... Five minutes left. Okay. <laughs> uh, chemical status. Uh, the Water Framework Directive, one of the objectives is achieving good surface water chemical status uh, by means that concentrations of pollutants cannot exceed the environmental quality standards established in the directive. Overall, in the European Union, for the second cycle, the percentage of water bodies that are of unknown chemical status has decreased significantly for around 40% to around 15%. In Baltic region, we still have a lot of work to do because, uh, for example, in Denmark, Estonia and Latvia, we have situations that um, more than 60% 60 60 of uh, surface water bodies is of unknown status. Uh, overall, the extent of monitoring of priority substances in the Baltic region is very diverse, reflecting difference in population density and intensity of pressures between member states, as well as in different strategies of, uh, for monitoring. And, um, Generally, only few chemicals have individually a large impact on status. For example, heavy metals and persistent organic pollutants. And uh, mercury is the main source of failures to meet good, quali uh, good quality criteria, good chemical status for waters. And uh, in order to reduce mercury, mercury pollution, uh, a special mercury regulation was adopted uh, in order to, do, to reduce the use of mercury and uh, to improve management of mercury waste. Uh, about the quantitative status of groundwater. Uh, so the definition, good groundwater quantitative status is, could be achieved when the level of groundwater in the groundwater body is such that the available groundwater resource is not exceeded by the long-term annual average rate of abstraction. In overall, groundwater quantitative monitoring improved during the second cycle. In Baltic region, six member states increased the coverage of groundwater bodies by quantitative monitoring. Uh, decreases were observed only for Estonia and Finland. But nevertheless, a significant number of groundwater bodies, around 65%, 
are still without quantitative monitoring sites in some member states. In general, the groundwater quantitative status situation is positive and uh, around 90% uh, of the groundwater uh, bodies be at good status. Groundwater chemical status. The definition, groundwater chemical status is huge when the monitoring data do not show exceedance of relevant standards and groundwater concentrations do not result in status failure or associated surface waters. So there is dire direct link uh, from groundwater uh, to surface water without good status of groundwater, we will not get the good status of surface waters. Uh, about 84% of groundwater bodies uh, in good groundwater chemical status. The overall chemical status of groundwater bodies improved only very little since the first uh, cycle. The reported, the reported expected, <laughs> the reported expected uh, achievement of good status for most of the groundwater bodies demonstrates the long time lag between the implementation of measures and their effectiveness. In overall, groundwater chemical monitoring did not improve significantly the first cycle. In Baltic region, only Estonia have now full coverage of groundwater bodies by surveillance monitoring, while Finland, Sweden, Denmark have still limited coverage of groundwater bodies. And he, here you can see the map uh, with the uh, groundwater monitoring stations uh, within the European Union, and here we have a Baltic, Baltic Sea region, and you can see that there is a significant difference in the number of groundwater monitoring stations, and uh, it influenced by the um, size of the country and the intensity and type of groundwater usage. And the higher density is where, uh, for countries where gro uh, groundwater is a source of drinking water. What about Latvia? In Latvia, we have, according to uh, results of Water Framework Directive uh, report, uh, almost all water bodies in Latvia which were monitored uh, are of good, very good, good or medium um, physical, chemical and biological uh, quality. So we are living in green country. And a uh, summary of this presentation, uh, despite that the European Union water policy resulting in a significant improvements uh, to water quality over the past four decades, there are still significant pressure on water quality and quantity. More intensive implementation of programs is still needed in the Baltic region to achieve the uh, objectives of the Water Framework Directive. All member states from the Baltic region with exception of Lithuania, reported their plans under the Water Framework Directive for the period 2015 to, from 2015 and 2021 to the European Commission, but the, uh, this information on the March of 2016. Uh, overall, no, in overall knowledge uh, and reporting of the WFD, information have significantly improved compared to the previous cycles. Good policy measures were taken and a number of financial investments were made, but in many water bodies, improvements in water quality is needed and will take time. And the uh, majority of groundwater and surface water bodies has achieved good status and trends in several individual quality elements and substances are positive. And just for your information, in 1993, the United Nations General Assembly adopted resolution according to which 22nd of March of each year is declared as a World Day for Water. It's just for your information and please respect water. Thank you. Thank you, Zinters. Are there any questions? Not from you. <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Uh, I would ask about this uh, Lielupe river basin. Why this water in Lielupe river basin groundwater is with bad water quality? Do you have? I don't answer? have any comments because uh, we really don't know about the um, what 
are the sources of this pollution? I don't know. Because, uh, for example, if we are speaking about the Riga region or Liepa region, uh, there are some, uh, some manufacturers, some, some processes which could pollute water. But uh, about Lelupe, I don't know. Just a small comment from the representative authority, which is responsible for, for uh, development of the river basin management plans. Uh, for Lielupe, it's most probably the quality problems are due to the agriculture and in pollution from nitrates. Okay. So, because it's the nitrates uh, well, vulnerable territory. It sounds very good question, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for Liepai, uh, the, the main problem uh, is, is similar to Riga, and it is connected with the water abstraction, so it's more related to water quantity problems. So it's been, historically, it's been, uh, it's been uh, depression, this uh, uh, de depression hall, or what, how you call it. It's due to abstraction, so intensive abstraction during the, like, uh, 80s, uh, last, last century. So... And now it's uh, improving slowly, but it's still considered as a problem or risk territory. Other comments or questions? No? This is, shall I give you the floor? Thank you, Zinters. Give applause to Zinters. Our next presentation will be, I assume, about liver worms and Kont and Skinny Kod in Baltic Sea. Yep. So now the floor is mine. Uh, those who don't know me, uh, I probably will surprise you as I don't study fish. I don't study environment. I study parasites. I'm parasitologist. So everything what I'm going to tell you about fish today, please don't take serious because I'm not an expert in this field. So. These are actually only the preliminary results as we just started this study last year and I think it's, this study is very valuable and uh, we probably, we will continue this. Um, so this is a study about anisakida nematodes in Eastern Baltic cod. Um, and um, yeah, most of you know much better about, well, from, most of you know better what's, what's the situation uh, in, uh, with the Eastern Baltic cod in uh, our sea. So I'm not going to go into details, but we all know that the cod stock has been collapsed. There are many studies which show that. So we, even in the Google, <laughs> you can find many graphs showing this. So it was quite easy for me to find that. Um, there are, of course, you again, you know better than me, that there are many factors which affect this. And um, one of my favorite factors are these uh, nice animals, uh, nice seals, which, uh, and this is also one of my favorite graphs which I could find that uh, because of the increasing seal population, the cod population is decreasing. So probably the uh, gray seals are the ones who, who do that. But then I have a question. What else are common for the seals, uh, for those nice seals? I like them. Uh, and the cod. Do you have answers? As I have very few slides, uh, my presentation is very short, so I'm trying to involve you. <laughs> but, so do you know what's common? Yeah, good. But you're not going to tell me. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so there are those nice worms, nice nematodes, uh, which uh, uh, lives in the seals as well as in cods. In Anisakida family, it's a huge uh, family of the nematodes, includes several uh, genus. I have forgotten to add even one more, but there's Anisakis probably, you have heard about these nematodes, but there's this one even scarier nematode, Pseudoterra nova. Uh, the first ones are zoonotic, so they are pathogenic uh, for humans, so uh, be aware if you eat them. And then there are other three, three more uh, genus which are not uh, very pathogenic for humans. So the life cycle of Anisakida nematodes are quite simple. The seals excrete with their feces, excrete the eggs of the nematodes. Then the zooplankton eats the 
X and then the uh, larvae develops further and then the fish eats zooplankton and that's how the nematodes uh, get into the fish. Um, so then uh, seals are different kind of uh, species are uh, definitive hosts. So in the seals, the nematodes live in the intestine. Uh, zooplankton, uh, zooplanktonic crustacea are intermediate hosts and um, fish are paratonic hosts, so different kind of fish, also carnivore fish and the pelagic, pelagic fish, pelagic. yes, sorry. So anisakiasis, it's a zoonotic disease, which means if we eat infected fish, un unproperly cooked, and if we eat the fish containing these nematodes, we can get the disease. There are two types of the disease, the, the gastric uh, symptoms, which uh, appear already several hours after eating this infected fish and the intestinal um, uh, phase of the disease it may even appear uh, several weeks after uh, the infection but that's not the worst thing the worst thing is that that from the anisakis uh, um, as as from the worm uh, there are lots of allergens allergens and very uh, how to say uh, people uh, can get allergies and not even uh, after eating alive worms even there are latest studies showing that eating in a for example frozen uh, frozen um, uh, cod or other fish uh, meat infected with the larvae where the larvae are dead uh, still people can get this uh, allergens anisakis is the only uh, worm or only parasite which is also in, included in EU regulations, which mean that, uh, which says that all imported uh, uh, fish, uh, imported fish products in Europe should be deeply frozen because anisakis may survive minus 20 degrees if we freeze it, and uh, it may survive when we prepare a fish by salting and other methods. So it's quite uh, a good survivor. Survivor. There are no officially reported uh, human cases in Latvia, but that's not a notifiable disease, so uh, even if there are any cases, we probably would never know about them. So I agree, I would say that there is, this disease is underdiagnosed in our country. So that gave uh, <coughs> us the aim to start to study, or also finally in our country, because in, uh, in Polish, uh, Baltic Sea water, they have already intensive studies on, of this nematode. We know that the uh, Anisakida nematodes are also very prevalent, for example, in Italy, and they do a lot of intensive studies, but we have never done this before. So, not me, but the Fish Resorts Department, they collected the fish from two regions of Baltic Sea. Uh, we just received the cod liver, uh, the cod liver was previously uh, frozen, and so we st in the lab we started to analyze. We started with visual inspection, but sometimes larvae, uh, when, when the fish is already dead, but larvae are still alive, they uh, like to penetrate inside the liver, so it's not so easy to see by visual inspection. So we also did the artificial digestion for the livers, uh, and then it's much easier on the sea. We can uh, the, all the material of river has been then digested, and it's easy to see the larvae and count. Uh, those which were able to differentiate by morphology, we did identify them by morphology. But as I mentioned, the uh, the livers were frozen before we started, so uh, there were larvae which were already destroyed, and it was not impossible to to identify the genus, even genus, uh, because they were damaged. So we did the further studies with PCR to differentiate the species. In total, we analyzed 276 cod liver samples. The prevalence was 40%. Uh, we didn't find any differences between the two regions, so the 30% prevalence was in both regions. And we also didn't find any difference here between the seasons. So the same in spring and uh, in winter, the, uh, the prevalence was the same. The mean intensity ranged from one to uh, 
the intensity ranged from 1 to 113 parasites per liver. Comparing to other studies, uh, for example, a study is done, a, the study was done in 2012, they published in 2014 in the, uh, the Polish colleagues. As you can see, the, the prevalence are significantly lower the, uh, comparing to that what we found. But the other study, which were done in the same, again in Poland, but in other region, uh, they, in 2012, they found also quite high prevalence. But still, in this study, they compared the previous results, which were uh, collected in 1983, and then they co uh, compared the new data in, uh, 20, uh, 20, in 2012, and as you can see, the increase are uh, very significant. We also try to analyze if there are any correlation between the mean intensity of larvae or, and prevalence uh, of the infected fish uh, depending on the fish age. And as you can see, the older the fish, the, there's the higher uh, risk, not, not the risk, the higher probability to be infected. And also we got the same results with the length of the fish, which is uh, uh, quite obvious, because the older the fish, the bigger the fish. So then we did, for those, and uh, uh, we did the PC studies with PCR. Uh, we uh, identified only Contratecum osculatum, which means that in the fish, uh, those fish were quite uh, safe to eat, as Contratecum is not so zoonotic, it should not be zoonotic, but there are also cases that it caused some kind of disease. There are, we still continue the, our molecular studies because uh, at the moment we have analyzed 100, uh, uh, the larvae from 100 fish, but we still, as you saw, we have a lot of jobs still to do. Um, there were only one case where the molecular the analysis didn't show like precise result that it's contratecum osculatum, and it's just, there's, so there's only one case and we have suspicions that this could be Anisakis simplex, which is super pathogenic for humans, but we still need to confirm. But again, if we look to the previous studies, uh, probably we found Contratecum osculatum only because we analyzed only livers. If we would analyze also other parts of the intestines, uh, Contratecum may also be in the, uh, in the, on the, oh, <laughs> on the organ, other organs, not only liver. So if we also could, could get the intestines, we probably would get even a higher prevalence or even probably we could find also other species. Also for Anisakis simplex, in, a, uh, in a Poland, <laughs> they, use, they found more, more Anisakis simplex in, uh, in Philip. So probably we need to analyze also fish fillet, not only the intestines. The same with Pseudoteranova. Uh, this is a very nice parasite because it can feel, I, I could say it can feel that the fish is dying. It's normally located on the surface of the internal organs, but the, when it feels that the fish is dying, it start, tries to leave the fish and the, the directly, so it stuck in the muscle, so that's in the fillet. So that's why most of the cases we can find only in fillet. And also in uh, studies done in Poland, uh, the Contratecum osculatum was the only one found in the uh, cod liver. So, few conclusions. This is the first comprehensive, this kind of study in Latvia, so uh, don't judge us too much. Um, uh, so, still we can see that the prevalence is uh, significantly higher than uh, found in the previous studies. I think we could agree that because of this increasing seal population, also the Anisakis prevalence is increasing in Baltic cod, and we will continue. We will continue our studies as we are collect, uh, as I know that the new samples have been collected together with the intestines. and. Uh, after making this presentation, I know that next year I will ask for the whole fish <laughs> because we need to see if we have uh, worms in the muscles of fish as well. So, thank you for your attention. And now it's your turn to... Thank you, Gunita. We just heard that parasites could be also very nice. Yes. You didn't know that. I didn't know it personally, really. 
So, do we have questions about some nice parasites? Nice question, please. Uh, to all these uh, people uh, who are uh, dealing with these uh, parasites, we said that uh, um, they could live only in uh, Calanus finmarchicus, uh, which are uh, relatively rare in the Baltic Sea. So, uh, Calanus finmarchicus, this big one with big antenna. <laughs> So uh, we... I'm not studying that. Oh, <laughs> so so, so we it have looks like that they can live uh, in another species also. Yeah, it, uh, there are, so, there are a huge there. list of hosts of this mm -hmm. parasite. And then, as you see, the diversity of Anasakidian nematodes is very huge. So actually, I could say they can be everywhere. And I don't, they, are not, uh, they are not host specific. They are generalists, so they can be mm -hmm. in a different host. And uh, another question, uh, it was uh, once explained that uh, uh, infestation of uh, blue whiting, uh, Micromyces putasu, in the North Sea was uh, due to a uh, number of uh, uh, fish-eating birds. Yeah. And so, uh, is it also could, could, could be birds uh, which are... Uh, host of this uh, Anisakis? Yeah, not, not this uh, Contratecum osculatum, but other species of Anisakidae family have uh, used, uh, as a definitive host, they use birds, fish-eating birds. So there are species which use seals, whales, as you can see, dolphins and other mammals, but there are, there are others who, who use, uh, which use uh, birds. So there are high diversity. We have a lot of things to do yet, more. So just collect the samples for me. Behind you. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, there is a question. Uh, there is also partners uh, in this uh, study. There is also ichthyologist I, I saw as well. Yeah. Uh, have you made also some um, quality fish quality uh, comparison for those which are in, in, in infested uh, with this, or and those which not? Uh, if there is a same uh, age uh, for fish and uh, what is a, uh, is a skinny or not skinny compared to uh, each other. Thank you. Yeah. So we did calculate this full tons index and there were no differences between those skinny, normal and fat. Because in the study we, all, we had only two fishes which after this index are fat and they were infected. And the others one like were again 40-40%, the normal ones and skinny ones. So there were no differences. But we will do more studies on that. We will calculate more indexes. <laughs> Any question? Mars. One of co-authors. Uh, <laughs> you cannot I, ask me. I am me not any. a parasitologist, but for me it is interesting. It looks like that with uh, parasites with age of code is accumulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the question is, uh, is, uh, is it in literature or it is that we could cause some mortality, natural mortality? Because in our group, uh, where for Eastern Baltic Cod, the natural mortality we expect to increase. Can the, the parasites, can be the, the reason for this increased natural mortality? Another thing is, can uh, fish also get rid of these parasites? No, no just, uh, I'm not positive. <laughs> no, they cannot get rid of it. It's, it stays on the liver. It makes the, sometimes it, the worm makes the cyst around, so it's quite safe. You, it cannot get rid of it. But probably it could cause the mortality, but if the infection level is very high, as you saw, this is a 113, but that's not, that's still not high infection level. It's not. So it's. And when we, in the beer, when we analyze sometimes the cub, carbs, the, the cod, the packages with uh, liver cod, uh, it's sometimes so full with anisakis. <laughs> so you probably don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you will get allergies. That's what I can. I the can. Last question. 
Okay, thank you. I'm totally alien in this parasitic world, but uh, trying to put together two talks. This is talk from Titis and from you. Uh, the, there are evidences that cod is eating ground gobi. Are there, how, how familiar are you with parasites of round gobi? Are there, is there a potential that, that round gobi can also transfer some parasites to cod? Of course. Uh, you, you might not know this, so if you don't know, so, so for maybe some so, future, future research idea. I really don't know this, but, uh, but we can, yeah, that's an idea for next studies. But as you can see in the life cycle of the, of the nematodes, there's always a, uh, the code uh, can be excluded from, it's not obligatory uh, host of the parasite. These uh, plankton-eating fish, zooplankton-eating fish, are the obligatory hosts. But if the, f the cod eats this infected small fish or plankton-eating fish, then it gets infected. So normally the cycle can go, can go without cod. Okay. So yes, cod gets from the other fishes this infection, not from the... the Thank you, Gunita. <laughs> and we still have two very nice presentations, not questions. <laughs> yes. And we are inviting Jasna to present uh, her presentation. I'm a little bit shorter. <laughs> I don't know how to... Dear delegates, uh, I would like to express uh, that I'm very honored and uh, it is a great privilege to be here and present, present some of our results from, um, that were accomplished at the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at Stockholm University during my stay as a visiting researcher at this department by our group, Professor Joseph De Pierre, who was the principal investigator, Stefano Bell, Daniel Borg, Maria Bergström, Maria Mellering, and Oke Bergman. Uh, during my stay, we did some uh, experiments on the distribution of perfluoroctanoic sulfonoic acid. I will use uh, aberration PFOS for that, and uh, perfluoroctanoic acid, I will use aberration PFOA in my talk because it is mm -hmm. a very long <laughs> term. Um, today I will speak about the distribution of these chemicals, and our research was supported by unrestricted grants from 3M company, Svenska Institute, and research grants from Swedish funding ag agency FORMAS. PFOA and PFOS uh, belong to so-called perfluorochemicals, which were widely used during, uh, the, due to their uh, potent surfactant uh, properties in uh, numerous uh, applications, which were industrial or commercial applications. For many years, PFOA has been used uh, due to the similar surfactant potent application like PFOS and have been used not only as a product but it has been used as a precursor in production of some fluoropolymers and fluoroelastomers. It can also be uh, formed during the metabolism of these fluoropolyalkinated substances and was um, uh, de detected in the surface and the soil around the manufacturing uh, facilities. But it was also detected globally in the oceans and, the, pardon, in, and in the Arctic. This uh, global wide range distribution uh, is uh, suggestive that these chemicals can be 
found globally and that they are bioaccumulative and uh, they can be uh, found in biotattoo. Um, this uh, global distribution and um, the long half-life of these chemicals in human serum, that is uh, for PFOA four to uh, five years and for PFOS four to six years, have raised uh, a lot of concerns about uh, their potential effect on human health. So a lot of epidemiological studies have been done in order to find out if there is some uh, relation between uh, the exposition or presence of these chemicals and uh, human health. Some epidemiological studies have found association be between PFOA and uh, high cholesterol level, between PFOA and uh, kidney and thyroid disease, uh, some cancer diseases like pancreas, this, uh, pancer, pancreas cancer, and also for PFOS, high levels of PFOS and high cholesterol levels, also some um, uh, associations between this compound and uh, developmental uh, defects. Uh, most studies uh, have been uh, uh, during toxicological studies. Uh, it means that uh, the studies were done with a high dose of uh, these chemicals short-term exposition that is uh, very different from what the humans are exposed to. Humans are exposed to these chemicals mainly through the water, then through the food and air and dust, uh, home dust. So uh, the aim of our study was uh, actually to mimic the route of exposition of these chemicals. That is to say, to do dietary exposition to these chemicals and to do the exposition, uh, exposition with more uh, environmentally relevant doses. For that, uh, we wanted to uh, provide a detailed distribution of PFOA and PFOS in C57 black six mice following dietary exposure of one, three, and five days to achieve blood levels of PFOA in mice similar to those reported in human populations exposed either occupationally or unintentionally, and to achieve blood levels of PFOS, which will be environmentally relevant. For that, we use uh, male C57 black six mice. The experiments were done like two separate experiments. The mice were divided randomly into three groups of uh, three mice each for PFOA and PFOS experiment respectively. At the end of dietary exposure, one, three, and five days for PFOA experiment, we achieved the dose that uh, was 0 0.06 milligrams per kg per day using uh, radio-labeled PFOA. And for PFOX experiment, we also use radio-labeled S35 PFOA to achieve a dose of 0 0.031 milligram per kg. Uh, for PFOA, we used a little bit higher dose because uh, we were not sure that we will get uh, this uh, chemical in all the examined organs. At the end of, uh, of uh, the experiment, blood and tissue samples were collected all important tissue samples. I will not present all of them. And um, stored prior scintillation counting and quantification of hemoglobin content in each sample. We do the quantification of hemoglobin content in order to subtract the concentrations of uh, PFOA and PFOS present in all the tissues examined, which was uh, actually because of the presence of blood. We wanted to see what is the real concentration in the very same tissue. We use statistical package, commercial statistical package to evaluate our results. Liver has uh, had the, the highest concentration of uh, both chemicals and if we see the li liver to blood ratio, we can see that uh, this ratio 
uh, ranges between uh, four to uh, six for PFOA, a little bit lower than PFOS, and uh, it increases, uh, the concentration increases over time in all time points. For PFOA, this increasement is uh, uh, more obvious, and uh, we think that it is because that uh, during the third day, the plateau in the blood level was reached, and uh, this increasement or blood uh, liver to tissue blood ratio is increasing linearly as it is increasing in the uh, same tissue. Second uh, major compartment for PFOA and PFOS was uh, blood, where we uh, can see that uh, there is increasement in the concentration of blood with both uh, compounds for PFOA and PFOS. And this uh, increasement for PFOS, uh, we got f on the day one uh, concentrations that were in the same range at, uh, as those uh, in, um, um, in the population in the United States who was exposed to uh, contaminated drinking water. Then in uh, day three, we got the concentration higher than this one, 10 times higher than uh, general population in the United States, who was included in a C8 uh, study project. And uh, for day five, we got uh, increment in this uh, concentration, and this concentration level was in the same range with those who were occupationally exposed to this chemical. For PFOS, we also got the increasement in the uh, blood levels, day three, and uh, this level remained a little bit constant in the day five, but was at uh, the end of the highest level of uh, uh, environmentally exposed uh, population, but uh, also it was in the range liver and blood two of this chemical, PFOS, was in the range uh, of the population uh, in United States, Asia, and some European countries, as well as the concentration were concentrations were similar to those in wild uh, nature, like seals, birds, and polar bears. Uh, Holborn also expressed uh, high concentration of these uh, chemicals. Uh, they differed between PFOA and PFOS. There was a difference, difference between bone to blood ratio. Uh, for PFOS, it was surprising that we saw on the day one complete saturation with uh, this chemical, and here I don't present the data, uh, that we found that uh, both PFOA and PFOS were actually, uh, were actually uh, concentrated in the bone marrow. Skin and uh, muscles also express a huge amount of uh, these compounds. Skin to blood ratio was 0 0.3 and up to 0 0.6 for PFOS and was uh, increasing over time. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, skin comprises uh, 60 to 20 percent of uh, the hotel, total body mass of the animals, uh, it might contribute uh, significantly to the body burden of uh, these chemicals. Skin also ab absorbs uh, uh, PFOA, and PFOA has been found in nails and uh, hair in humans, but also in um, hair of uh, experimental animals. Muscles have shown the similar blood, uh, tissue to blood ratio like uh, skin, and also contribute uh, with the mass, total mass, from the total body mass, significantly to the uh, whole body burden of uh, these chemicals. The tissues contamin uh, containing the highest amounts of PFOA and PFOS were liver. After the liver for PFOS, the highest amount, or amount of PFOA was found in blood, then skin, muscle, and bone. For the PFOS, the highest amount after the liver was the bone, then blood, skin, and muscle. As a conclusion, we may say that PFOA and PFOS uh, were detected in most tissues and organs of mice following one, three, and five days of dietary exposure to an environmentally relevant dose which resulted in blood levels similar to various exposed human populations. 
Our dietary exposure mimics what is considered to be one of the major routes via which humans are exposed to this compound. After correcting for PFOA and PFOS present in the blood, PFOA and PFOS levels were highest in the liver, which is the only tissue that accumulated a higher level of PFOA and PFOS than the blood. The tissue levels of PFOA increased at all time points. The body compartments estimated to contain the largest amounts of PFOA and PFOS were the liver, blood, skin, muscle, and the whole bone. I would like you to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any questions in the auditorium? One? Okay, then I have a question. If uh, those chemicals would be found in uh, humans, would they also be in the same organs, blood, to liver, and the skin? Yes, uh, uh, for liver, for example, uh, there are only studies on post-mortem uh, human material, for example, liver, uh, where they found certain amount of uh, these chemicals, but the tissue to blood ratio in post-mortem human material was less than we found. It was uh, up till one. And we've, we found five, for example, for PFA after one day of exposure. For example, bones uh, also are in the same range, tissue to blood ratio with post-mortem material in humans. And um, do you know what does this chemicals cause for humans? Uh, there are epidemiological studies which are connecting this chemical to, for example, tumors, kidney, and uh, pancreatic tumors, mm -hmm. then also prostatal tumors, high cholesterol levels, thyroid disease, uh, hormonal disruption, uh, developmental uh, disruption. So actually, it has caused anything, everything. Everything. These everything. are persistent, Just persistent what? organic pollutants. Okay. Any other questions? And have a long half life. So. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have one question with regards to the, uh, your graph where you showed the uh, recovery of these chemicals mm -hmm. in, in different tissues. And uh, have you checked that is it a complete, absolute recovery no. by the no, organism no, no. or? It says that. It says that. It is not complete recovery according to what they have eaten. eaten. Yeah, by, but. Because we didn't use uh, metabolic cages. Okay, we use but there the, 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 the could be some biotransformation as well of these chemicals. No, in, in, they no? are not transformed. Oh, okay. They are, no they are, they are so stable. They, they stable. Okay. Uh, we checked uh, every organ. We checked even feces, what I found in the intestinum. Yeah. But this is the recovery according to 100 that we found in all the tissues as a Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you. Yeah. If there are no other question, then please give applause to Yasna. Thank you for your attention. And now it is time to move to our final presentation given by Ingus. And he's going to introduce us with his experience. Are you? I, I suppose so, yes. Do you know what to do? Uh, not really, but... Oh. So I press this one and oh, yeah. it starts and Shiro. this, yep. okay. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ingus and I suppose I'm here a little bit more for entertaining purposes, maybe less scientific. So I would like to talk you a little bit more about scientific expedition to the kingdom of the polar bears. Maybe you know, what is it? Maybe you don't. And I will reveal the secret, it's Svalbard. It's located around two and a half thousand kilometers from the point where we are standing right now. And uh, if we go north and uh, travel the seas a little bit far from the Norway, we reach the archipelago of several islands where there's very harsh Arctic conditions. And why does it, is it called the land of the polar bears? Because there are more polar bears than inhabitants. So in exact numbers, it's around 2,000 polar bears to 1,000 inhabitants. So 
two palavas per person, so that's a nice meal for them, and uh, not very good for us. So, why did we go to the exposition, and what was the destination, uh, and when did it happen? It happened across a approximately six months ago, and I was uh, given a very great opportunity, and uh, it was a little bit of surprise, but thanks to a very great communication from my supervisors and administration of Bayer, we were able to somehow manage that I was taken as a small part for the bigger expedition, which was uh, going uh, organized by University of Latvia, by more experienced explorers, because uh, I'm a rookie, I don't know anything about polar expeditions. I was just, you know, there's this, this guy who's just uh, going uh, along with the bigger guys and uh, trying to do the same thing, so that was me. And uh, those larger guys, those are the real polar experienced people, they have already been to Antarctica, to Greenland, to Iceland, so they have had some experience and they taught me how to do everything I was needed to do. So, thanks to them and thanks to the administration, all this was able to happen and the aim and the focus mostly was persistent organic pollutants. I suppose many of you already know what they are, but just to briefly remind that these are some nasty compounds found in the surrounding environment. As we uh, learned from the previous speaker, they can be found in mice and in us, so pretty much everywhere. And uh, so those compounds do not go on the metabolism processes. They can affect our health quite negatively and uh, do a lot of damage. And they bioaccumulate, so meaning that the higher on the food chain a member is located. For example, if you are a plankton, then persistent organic pollutants is not a big problem to you because you're a plankton. But if you are an apex predator, for example, a killer whale or a polar bear or a very predatory bird, then it becomes an issue because your lifespan is a little bit longer and you eat all those smaller creatures and you accumulate all the pollution that is in those smaller organisms. So that's a big problem. So there are several examples. We already know the perfluorinated compounds. There are legacy pollutants like dioxins, polychlorinated uh, uh, furans, uh, PCBs, PBDs, a lot of different abbreviations. And I can continue for several minutes with them. I won't. Uh, another important class of uh, sort of pseudo persistent pollutants is chlorinated paraffins, which has uh, got a lot of spotlight in recent years, and uh, it's a very compelling topic to study, but it's also very complicated, uh, as I learned very recently. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's uh, thousands of isomers of chlorinated paraffins, and there are different patterns, and uh, depending on the commercial origin of uh, the pollution, it can change from region to region, etc. And it's very an interesting research topic. And it also shows some persistent properties and bioaccumulates. Therefore, it is some sort of a little bit futuristic research where we can go with these uh, samples. So what is the current evidence? Why do we actually need to go to study glaciers? And uh, there are a couple of things going on. First of all, you might have heard that there's this climate change going on. Because if you look outside and if you look at the calendar, then there's a, a little difference between those things because it's in the middle of winter, you know, but it looks like autumn. There's a, of course, that's weather, and weather and climate are two little bit different things. And uh, I know I'm trivializing right now because you cannot do these uh, things like just look out of the window, but it is a nice example that how we can see that the weather here, for example, in Latvia is also changing by the times and who knows, maybe 20 years after this will be quite normal that they'll have winter without any snow. So that affects glaciers. As the climate is getting a little bit warmer, the glaciers are melting. But they weren't melting, for example, 70, 100 years ago. And uh, there were these legacy pollutants like, uh, for example, DDT, a very popular pesticide which was uh, uh, used quite frequently after the Second World War. And for example, or the uh, uh, atmospheric dispositions of those pollutants which came on top of the glaciers at the 40s, 50s, at the beginning of industrial revolution, and now they are 
beginning to get released because of this climate change thing. So therefore, there is quite an interesting uh, place to go to look for samples. And also there are some uh, specific uh, small holes in the glaciers where we can find some nice substances which we can re research further. And uh, so far there's uh, an increasing evidence the glaciers are also a nice field of research for persistent organic pollutants. So what was my aim? My aim was pretty basic. Go there, survive, don't die, come back, and uh, also grab some samples. So in total, I got uh, 250 different samples from uh, all around the surrounding area, and that included uh, animal feces, very hard to get actually there, if you are asking me. Then, of course, we have some uh, better samples which do not run away, and uh, you do not have to find so uh, frequently. That is uh, glacial meltwater, some vegetation, uh, soil samples, also these uh, uh, strange name cryoconites, which is the first image, and those are smaller uh, things on top of the glaciers. I'm not going into deep detail about them because it's pretty complicated, uh, even for me, so not going to waste too much time on that. So also we did some passive sampling because of course uh, the concentrations in surrounding area are low, so we need to get as much sample and as much information as we can, so also pass passive sampling is a very useful tool to do that. And uh, so I know that there is a lot of research going on with uh, these apex predators, but uh, as I said, I had no previous experience, for example, in trying to catch polar bear, because there are some publications where people are milking polar bears and then trying to look for persistent organic pollutants in them. So, but I guess I was a little bit too scared and I didn't meet any polar bears, so no polar bear milk or uh, tissue samples from me, I apologize for my supervisors for that, but we, get, we got something else. So what is the planned research on this? Firstly, the main focus is of course uh, the persistent organic pollutants and uh, especially the fingerprinting of laminated paraffins, hopefully. Uh, first of all, we would like to know more about the atmospheric disposition of laminated paraffins on top of the glaciers. We have information for, from four different glaciers and uh, also would like to see if there's some release of legacy pops. I don't know if there is because uh, it's actually quite unlikely in that area because the melting processes have been already going on in there for some 70 years. So it was just somewhere in the middle, so maybe we don't see anything there. Of course, we have also samples from Antarctica, from uh, which were uh, got because of the University of Latvia, because of the other polar expedition, what was going on in 2018. So it would be interesting to compare some different profiles between those things. And also, as uh, I was more focusing on uh, samples that do not run away, and which I was able to find, the plants were really nice, because uh, I was able to find them. And uh, so we also got a lot of uh, different plant species at different uh, parts uh, of the uh, surrounding area and maybe we'll try to, to see if any of those would work as the bioindicators which can accumulate at least some detectable amount of persistent organic pollutants as the instrumentation is getting more and more sensitive every year that the need for biota samples is slowly reducing and we can maybe use something different for that. And also the cryconites which uh, can be maybe used as a time capsules because the strange thing about those things is that they might form, for example, 10 years ago, and then it freezes over, and it doesn't come back for, let's say, 10, 20, 30 years, and then it just melts over. And if we are in the right place in the right time, we can get these uh, cryconites which have been locked in the frost for 30 years, so they contain information from the past. So that is also an interesting sample type to investigate. And of course we have more uh, maybe uh, urgent problems as uh, I have heard that, uh, that people are looking for also we have some collaboration institutions which are right now I suppose looking for resistant genes in the local uh, Svalbard fauna uh, feces and also some research in involving the local water, because the Longyearbyen, which is the main town of the Svalbard region, uh, doesn't have any wastewater treatment plants. That means all the wastewater goes in directly into the bay, and 
it takes everything along with it, including pharmaceuticals, including resistant genes and everything. So it can spread into surrounding nature. And uh, so how much time do I have left? Up to you. Up to me. Okay, so let's say seven minutes, right? And uh, in the next seven minutes, maybe a little bit more, I, I, I can promise, I will take you through some uh, more interesting things uh, than the, the previous slides. This was just the, the beginning. So I would like to show you some pictures because pictures are nice and uh, you are all tired. And uh, so just to want to sketch how the daily life and how, how does it look here? Because uh, when you talk about Antarctica, when I was going and uh, I, I have seen some videos and, and read some blogs and uh, asked some questions, but I didn't really know what to expect. How does it look? Are there like, a, when you go, there are like just polar bears waving at you and just, uh, or maybe you just go and they are like trying to attack you or, or is this like snow so high or is, it, is there nothing of snow? So let's have a brief uh, introduction into the life of Svalbard for, these, uh, uh, for the time of the expedition. So this is where we stayed, our team. Uh, this might not look like a pool station, more like a garden house somewhere in the middle of nowhere, but it is a polar station. It was built in the 70s, so it is quite old. And uh, it might not look so cozy. It is not. So the conditions are pretty harsh there. But it is better than staying in the tent, of course, because uh, if you are a tent and if there's a polar bear around there, so you are like a... Uh, a food in a can, you know, so it's easy to get, already packed. And uh, so there the packing is much harder, so the polar bears cannot penetrate the walls. Although they try, and there are even uh, like uh, the, the places where they have placed the, the claws and tried to get for the food, because this uh, small box on the what is it? Uh, right, that's all the food stashed. And uh, there have been several times when the polar bears have tried to attack that place. So. How does uh, the surrounding place look? Basically, all the area contains some tundra, marine, and glaciers. In the surrounding area, there are five glaciers, and uh, I will introduce to each one of them here. And uh, this is how the tundra looks. And as you see, there are no trees there. There are only uh, pretty much nothing. You see that there's a lot of meltwater channels, so the walking there is quite complicated. And of course, everything is covered in permafrost, except at least the deepest areas. But the top area is all, uh, uh, it's pretty hard to get walk there. And there's a lot of these small channels which just make every walking, every kilometer very exhausting. And taking into account that every day we have to get tw 10 to 30 kilometers of distance in order to travel to glaciers to gather samples, uh, that took some quite an effort. So the next obstacle is uh, murines, which are sort of uh, accumulated debris from the previous times when the glacier was moving and it was taking everything, all the rocks, all the debris, everything, and just pushing. So there is this, uh, uh, this very hard terrain formed, which is hard to get over, and uh, there's a lot of these... Uh, uh, smaller, bigger rocks and uh, cliffs and everything, and uh, it goes for around one kilometer from the end of the glacier. And uh, that was actually one of the toughest uh, things to cover in all day because uh, there's lots of dangers going on because uh, you, if you go and one missed step, and uh, it is the end of the expedition. So how does the perfect glacier look? So this is the glacier from some sort of beauty magazines. Uh, it was photographed there. It is not from the magazine, but this is uh, how we ex how we imagine how glaciers look. So it's big, blue, magnificent, and uh, it's really hard to grasp how big it actually is. If some of you have seen this popular TV series Game of Thrones, there is uh, this big wall of ice, and uh, so this is something similar because it looks small, but it's actually 50 to 70 meters high. So it's, it's, it's pretty big. And uh, walking on top of this particular glacier is basically impossible because uh, it has too much of these crevices and uh, it is constantly moving into the sea. So a lot of ice is just going into there and uh, it's sort of alive. So let's move to some a little bit uh, normal glaciers, how they look. So this is a, a photo from a drone 
this is how a uh, normal terrain of glacier looks. There are some meltwater rivers on top of that. There are also some crevices. And uh, this is what we work with. So every day look, uh, as you can see, it has been snowed already. And uh, the expedition can be divided into two parts before the snow and after the snow. Before the snow was really nicer, although it looked not so nice, but at least you could see the terrain and where you put your steps. But uh, when the snow came, everything was covered in like 30, 40 centimeters of snow, and uh, you cannot see any crevices, and uh, the rivers are covered, and uh, so all the walking is possible only with the sticks and special equipment. Everyone had to have an ice pick, and uh, so it takes a lot of time just to travel 100 meters on this uh, glacier when there's snow. Um, another glacier. Not going to go into deep details about that. Looks small, is big, as always. Uh, about the dangers, this is how the crevices look. And uh, this is some um, two meters wide opening. It, again, looks uh, not too wide, but uh, when it's covered by snow, uh, you have to be really, really careful when uh, going across of it. So this is how these things uh, look when the snow is. And uh, the glacier has sort of like a cardiovascular system of uh, water because it reacts to surrounding conditions. For instance, uh, if the temperature goes a little bit below zero, it stops immediately almost. There are some very slight movements, uh, some slight melting, but in reality, it's just all very quiet. And if it goes, for example, for plus three degrees, you can already see very, very huge difference between how the, uh, the top of the glacier acts because all the rivers come alive and uh, it becomes much more complicated to travel there. So uh, this is how close we saw the bear one day. So we, I didn't actually saw a bear for my disappointment and yours, sorry. But, uh, so, but we see a lot of footprints and we also managed to film a polar bear while we were working on the field. And uh, although day on the the first days, this uh, big shadow of polar bear and the possible danger was uh, always with us, but on the end of the expedition, it was so used to that uh, you go and you see the, these things, and it's like, ah, it's okay, it's fine. And the Polish guys, which were staying there for already uh, quite some time, they were like, eh, it's a polar bear, doesn't matter. So it's just a matter of attitude. And uh, so there were. <coughs> Also, some animals which do not try to kill us. As I heard before, that actually I was wrong because uh, those f fury foxes might carry rabies. And uh, so it was fortunate for us. We didn't try to domesticate them and pet them. Good for us. And uh, those were the only two species which we saw on terrain, except for birds. So nothing more lives there. Polar bears, polar foxes. And small about reindeer, those are the mammals, the big mammals, which are living on top of the land, and the rest is uh, something different. So how the field work looks, <coughs> uh, so we didn't have a lot of time to take photos about field work because, you know, we had to work and it was pretty uh, complicated to manage everything at that point, but uh, these are just uh, a couple of frames. Uh, what does it look on day? And uh, it really depends what sort of day it is. If it was sunny, it was really like a paradise, of course. It was really nice. It was not windy. And uh, you can always take your jacket off and uh, felt like home. But uh, when the snow came, of course, it became true winter. And uh, also the working conditions were much more harsher. So that's about it. That's how we looked. And uh, I'm very grateful for the. Uh, that I had this opportunity and uh, hopefully it will yield some good research material in the near future and some published work. Thank you. Thank you, Ingus, for, this, for your entertainment. Can I take it? At all, yes. No, no one did, so I... <laughs> any comments? I don't think we have questions for him, but any comments or anybody else would like to join him? In polar expedition, did did he inspire you? Inspired you to go there?
a very good place for tourism. So if you like the pictures that you see and you wanted to see more, <coughs> you can go pay some money and go there. And there are very nice uh, sort of safari rides with boats to see the polar bears and whales and uh, all sorts of stuff. So highly recommend. But just don't stay in tents. That's dangerous. <laughs> don't get. Don't become a snack. I was hoping you didn't ask any sort of this question. Uh, waste is very problematic because, uh, you know, people litter a lot. And uh, we were eight people staying in the polar station. And obviously, it creates a lot of waste. And uh, burning was the way of uh, everything was burned. And uh, I'm not going to tell what, what happened to the uh, content of toilet. That's, uh, that stays between me and the, and the guys who were, what happens in, in Svalbard stays in Svalbard, you know. But uh, yeah, everything was burned or recycled. The things that you cannot burn were recycled in special canisters and once a year they go with the ship and uh, get them back to the mainland because uh, there's no, of course, just uh, impossible to gather the, the trash. Any other questions? I think then we can give applause again to Ingus. Thank you. Yeah, and now I think it, this is a very sad moment. I'm almost crying because we need to close this very nice session. And I hope we will meet again. I would like to thank you all for this very, very interesting session. Uh, I think I learned a lot. Now I know more fish species <laughs> than no, before. No, know even about nice parasites. No, you know that parasites are nice. Yes. Unfortunately, nice. unfortunately nice. you did not, uh, uh, you were not presented in that session where I gave a great talk about parasites. But we still have one good news. Yeah. It's still coffee available. So uh, don't run away, have a coffee, have more discussions with the colleagues from elsewhere, <laughs> other words. And still posters also are, are, are available. We still have authors. And there is a last chance to ask some questions to our poster authors. Ivers, do you want to say something? No. No. Yes, <laughs> yes. Remember that you have been recorded, so please use the microphone. Yeah. Ivers. Sorry, thank you. Just a fi final remarks because I was between the two sessions and I did manage to be uh, didn't manage to be uh, in the session when we discussed uh, with uh, Eric about the seal health. And in this session, at the same time, you discussed about the mitigation of the seal uh, population. And at the same time, we discussed about the health status of the seals in the Baltic Sea. So it was uh, we are discussing about the viruses and parasites that are affecting the seal population and what we may expect in the near future and so on. That's a nice. That's a, our goal is reached because behind those two walls, so we were interacting between the one health and the water resources, environmental safety. This is a goal and this is a world where the, where the beer works for. And uh, thanks a lot for your uh, all our presenters today and uh, all our collaborators and the friends and colleagues. So thanks a lot. And thanks for uh, both uh, chairpersons for this session. And uh, please welcome. There's a coffee, posters, and a discussion. Thanks a lot and have a safe trip back home and enjoy the afternoon. Okay, thank you.